can join the crew for the ride. Xbox, mobile, and hot topics around the nation. To gaming rigs, headsets, hardware, and PlayStation. Shout out to Joe. Can't you see him glow? Token brother brought the flow. Now it's time for the show. Let's go. go. What's going on, guys? Welcome to Revolver Live, the gaming podcast that says forget the past. The future belongs to the nerds. I'm the Beastly Gamer. Today, I'm joined by three of the best guys in the business of podcasting. Briar Rabbit, the king of all things destiny. What's going on, brother? I have no idea. <laughs> and that's why he's the best. <laughs> you doing good this week, man? You having fun out there in the world? Doing great. Gaming? Doing great. Been doing a lot of photography this weekend, so I'm uh, a some little sunburnt, already, man. little sunburnt, a little tired. But I'm feeling good because I'm two beers deep already, and I'm ready to rock. It's going to be a live, <laughs> a live show. Gary Diaz, yes. how you feeling, my UK brother? I'm feeling good. I've spent most of this week sucking at the rotting phallus of Steve Jobs. I've gone and bought an iPhone 8. What? I've, I've done it, yes. Oh wow, God. that's a hell of a way to describe a purchase, man. I don't know if I want to congratulate you or send you some Listerine, but I'll go with the congratulations. <laughs> how are you liking the phone? Well, I'm like what a thousand dollars lighter, but it's uh, <laughs> it does everything my old phone did, but it does it in a more expensive way. So <laughs> it's it's kind of good. <laughs> it's the champagne of phones, basically. I'm surprised. I'm surprised you didn't get the iPhone X or the iPhone 10. It's not out yet, but you know I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm considering maybe looking at it. What I like about the um, the iPhone 8 is the innovation. What they've done is they've taken the um, headphone jack and, and rather yeah. than put it in the phone, they give you on a little bit of string there. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, yeah that innovation. takes courage. Courage right there. Courage. Innovation. A little dongle. <laughs> they want to be different and, and, and make a new dongle for your enjoyment. Hold on Ryan. to that thing, man, because goddamn, I lost my dongle like three months ago. I have no idea where it went. <laughs> I haven't I mean, seen my dongle in months. Yeah, I, I look for mine every time I get in the shower. I find it sometimes. <laughs> Ryan Playing with it Wilson. too much. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, what's up, Beasley? How what's you doing, up, man? Brother? How you doing, man? Dude. I wanted to give a shout out to you guys. Uh, I've been playing some Destiny with you guys, you and Gary. Uh, and it's really been a, a very uplifting and spiritual experience. Uh, namely, Gary, I wanted to say that really quickly. Thank you for helping me get through the nightfall. Uh, having you and that ama amazing voice power me and my wife through that event. Mm. I think it was just your voice alone that sent us in the right direction and made us pull our triggers. But Is that the first time you've ever done a Nightfall, Beastly? Yeah, that was my Nightfall Cherry. I've never, oh, I've never played. No, that was a tough one. Tell week, us about man. it. How'd it go, man? Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, we went through three times, right? Uh, I want to yeah. say three times. It took third time's a charm. The first two times we were learning the ropes uh, and getting into, you know, the correct position and playing our roles and, you know, yeah. be, being where you need to be. And that's really what you have to do in these type of events. That's why I'm excited to get into a raid. But it took... You know, we were so close the second time. The second time we had, oh God, the last boss had maybe a sliver of health left and we ran out of time. And so we figured a way to get through the first two sections much quicker and get to him in enough time to destroy him. But it's teamwork, the team dynamic. Uh, I told Gary at the end of that event, I felt like we had bonded in a way that we hadn't before because he's predominantly on PC. And I say, fuck those bitches, but he's a good guy. And I really appreciate him. I uh, love the out. Nightfalls, Beastly. The Nightfalls in Destiny 2 are actually, I think, fantastic. The way they've introduced the time limit means yeah. that you have to create yeah. a strategy as a team and then execute that strategy together. And like you said, it is a bonding experience, right? It really was. Because you have to work on this strategy together. And then if somebody's fucking up, you got to find a way to tell them that <laughs> without <Yeah>. pissing <laughs> them off, right? Like you got to, yeah. like, you know, you got to work together as a team. It's the Nightfalls, I think they're the best Nightfalls. Nightfalls have ever been like in in year one yeah. of Destiny. Nightfalls were great, but they were long, and you could cheese them if you had an, yeah. an hour to spare. In De in Destiny, uh, in the Taken King, and in uh, Rise of Iron, Des Nightfalls sucked. They were they're just bullshit. But now Nightfalls feel like end game content, and the addition of the timer means that there is a level of difficulty there and a level of strategy in. In PVE content that I think is really cool. Like, it's well, fun. Well, one thing that caught me off guard, it really, I wondered if there was something wrong. Because uh, during we had some issues with the network. Uh, Destiny servers were going down. Yeah. And I was uh, going to certain characters and, and getting Ingrams and things. And they were giving me, like, level 10 Ingrams, I mean, weapons. 
you know, legendary weapons are at like level 15. And I was like, what the hell's going on? It should be 285. It's only 15. So I figured we we're having some issues. And so when I saw the the nightfall for the very first time before Gary had joined us, I saw a 15 minute time limit limit. And I remember last week you said there was a, a 60 minute time limit. So I was thinking there must be some kind of issue here. They can't expect us to be in a nightfall in 15 minutes. This has to be some kind of mistake. And so, yeah, it was one of those feet to the fire type of moments. You had to get your shit together, do it quick. You had to execute when you need to execute. And it was a lot of fun, man. It really makes me pine for the past that I just never got got a chance or, you know, I was doing other things rather than digging deep into Destiny. But it was a lot of fun. Other things meaning The Last of Us. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know what? It actually gave me a new new or a different perspective on... The nightfall as well and some of the end game content because it's worth bright br- briefly touching on this there's been a lot of rumbling this week about destiny 2's end game content whether mm. it's you know suitable or not suitable etc and i got to see um and i don't mean this uh, the term disrespectfully basically because obviously i know you and kate play it as a couple and you enjoy that experience but i got to see the nightfall from a casual gamer's perspective and someone who is playing i don't a few take hours offense a night. to that i don't Do take not, any offense yeah, yeah i understand i, I am your approach to it and i got to see someone who's hitting the nightfall for the first time over the weekend um and getting to play through it and you know maybe never done the nightfall fall before and for you that content's still very satisfying and next week you look <laughs> yeah, forward you actually said to kate you know we can do this every week this is really cool this is something we can get on every week and do it once together and you know you're not looking at it and thinking we're starved of content you're looking at it and thinking this is great content for me to come and visit every single week yeah so it's to me it gave me a new appreciation for what a whole different demographic in the community is experiencing when it comes to end game content to what we're feeling. Yeah. I mean, for me, I love you guys to death. We're brothers from other mothers from other countries, but you guys are hardcore destiny players. And I don't, you know, I don't think I'll ever be as good as you guys at destiny. I don't think it's about good. I think it's about time spent. And, and and dedication. You guys actually make time. You, You carve out time in your day to do these things. And for me, it's, really, really hard. And and I'm not making an excuse for myself, but it's, it's just been really hard for me to even be where I am now. I'm amazed that I took time to, to get where I am. Um, but I don't have any issue with that. But for me and like my wife, every time we play Destiny, every single day, every moment that we play, we've done it together. She's higher light than me, you know, and, and she's a she's getting her feet wet. We've been going crucible, loving it, you know, learning about these weapons that have just been destroying, destroying my might of multi-tool, like hard light and some of these other weapons that seem cheesy as hell. So we're learning, but uh, we, we're really enjoying what we've, what we've seen so Feasley, far. This, I, did Peanut K get into the Warren? Yeah. Is that all taken care of? Okay. Yep. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. you, get some, you get some really good rewards being in a clan, but yeah. like on the Nightfall, uh, me and uh, Mr. Tom Foolery and Spiffy McTaco actually did the Those names prestige, are awesome. prestige Ooh, Nightfall prestige. this week. And it's bugged right now. Um, you actually can't complete it. Uh, like, so you get to the second area where the big blue pillars spawn in, and you got to go through them and scan the anomalies or whatever. They don't pop up in the second area, thus not allowing you to progress completely through the nightfall. But if your entire fire team goes back on their sparrows to the very first area, it spawns them ahead of you again. So we were actually able to find a workaround to get nice. those to spawn in. And you completed it? <clears throat> and we got to, uh, you have to take down this big uh, devil walker before you get in. And there was another fire team there doing the same thing that we were doing. So we had two fire teams on the same fallen walker, which you never get in that area in a nightfall. And we crushed the fallen walker in like 10, 15 seconds. We all went into our own instance, and I think we finished it with like 30 seconds left, maybe like 15 seconds left for the prestige. And it it kind of sucks. Like they there was that issue with the trials map where they had a bug, so they reverted it back to last week's map in game mode. But they didn't really do anything about the prestige nightfall. Yeah, you know what I mean. They just kind of like just kind of like let it be and let the community kind of figure out a way to get through it. So. That was my experience with the Nightfall this week, and it was pretty cool. Um, we just kind of talked about doing it, and then we did the Nightfall, and one of the guys was like, oh, we could totally knock that out if we figure out how to you know, basically cheese that one part and get it to do what it's supposed to do. And we did, 
And it was pretty cool. The rewards is cool. Like, it's kind of like a chance to get two Nightfalls done a week on each character. So you could potentially do six. Oh, what, really? A, a week. Yeah. 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 It's a little if you have another end game. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like a. It, I, I imagine that at some point when we're at all 350 light, we won't actually be doing the regular Nightfall at all. We'll just be doing prestige. only prestige. I, yeah. Does it does it give you both rewards for doing the prestige? I think it still gives you a powerful engram. Like it's basically just doing it again and getting the rewards like that. So is it worthwhile doing the normal nightfall than the prestige, or is it? Do you I would get say all so. The rewards just from doing the prestige. You get uh, no. You can do. I think it's worth it to go do the normal nightfall than the prestige one. I don't think when you do the prestige one that it gives you the rewards from the the other one. I don't think it does. I oh, think okay. you have to do both. But they still both give you powerful engrams, which are tied to your light. So I think there'll be a reason to do both of them all the time. Oh, sounds Talking sweet. About so light, um, basically, what light are you at, you and Kate? You mentioned that you she's higher light than you. What, what are you guys at? Now? She's at 283, and I'm at 282. We just can't get any equipment past 276. It's so hard to get anything new. And I know that we need to do the raid. The raid is going to give us more powerful stuff. But, I no, mean, we gotta I got to plan, like, uh, we got to plan a revolver raid. We got to get, get a revolver raid going. Like that's what's got to happen. Say when. I mean, I'm probably too too low level. I don't want to do what I did. Can we can we commit? Know. Like, are we willing to commit to Tuesday night on air? That's fine. Yeah. I'm down. Work for everybody. I'm yeah. feeling it. That's fine. Just let me know what time so I can. All right. Make sure we'll talk I'm about that. Studio. We'll talk about uh, off air, and then we'll we'll figure out uh, exactly what time on Tuesday. All right, and so for the people watching us wondering what the hell is going on, Revolver Live is a gaming podcast with six revolving topics. You can become a part of the show by submitting your topics for consideration at revolvergamescast at gmail.com. That's revolvergamescast at gmail.com. We go live every Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv forward slash briarrabbit. That is twitch.tv forward slash briarrabbit. If you're unable to see the live video or the video formats, you can always check us out on your favorite podcast service, iTunes, Podbean, or wherever you do your podcasting. And with that, welcome to Revolver Live episode 10. We're 10, guys. 10 of these. You feeling, you feeling old yet? No. No. Okay, Nine. me neither. <laughs> Every day. Sometimes sometimes when I sleep wrong, I feel old in the morning, but not mm-hmm. today. I feel pretty good okay. today. <laughs> I, didn't get, I didn't get any sleep last night, but Brian, I feel so awake right now. You do know me. That's awesome. <laughs> you guys want to start off with some topics? Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. I think right, let's do it. Before we get into the, our first topic, I really wanted to really quickly say this. I went fishing yesterday for the very first time in my life. Fuck you, you didn't go fishing. I did. Oh, and we didn't. ate the fish. You it was ate good. the fish? Those motherfuckers was banging. What Tartar sauce, hot sauce, man? Like, did you fish them out? Uh, Sh- Lake Shamrock here in Georgia, okay? It's a public fishing spot, and it's beautiful. How many you Shamrocks? All right, Lake Shamrock. I don't know, you, but I got lucky. We caught eleven fish. Like there's a McDonald's just dumping the 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 toxic shamrock waste that's shakes. used to make shamrock shakes. <laughs> did you count how many eyes each individual fish had? Did any of them have three eyes? I'm just no, asking the no. question. I just cut the heads off when I got them, Gary. But I did it with my kids, and and they thought it was an amazing thing, and that's something that every dad really cherishes. I've wanted to do it, but I've never known how to do it. My dad never did it. Set it so up for I us, took, Beasley. How, how did you do it? Like, uh, did you? Uh, were you standing the, on shore? Were you standing in a river? Fly we, yeah, fishing? we were standing on shore. Uh, and you were uh, casting bobbers. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it was me. Uh, my best friend, his name is John Speakman. I got a, a coworker. He's seventy three years old. Great guy. And uh, he goes out here and fishes routinely. And he's been telling me about it for years. And he's asked me to go. And finally, he came around and said, "Hey, man, I want to get you and your boys out, and we go out and fish." And I was like, "Well." It'll probably be a waste of time, man. And he said, no, just come over at 7. We'll go out to this spot. And so I went over his house. We went out to this beautiful, beautiful lake, all these homes on the lake. And uh, his friend owns this big lot, this house with a, a huge lot. And yeah. so we went out back and we started casting. And he was explaining to us, going through every step of, of fishing and how patience is the key. And Yeah, that's it. the hard part about fishing, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. But, at, you know, we stayed out there from 8 o'clock and we left around 1130 and caught a turtle, caught a uh, 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 striped bass. <laughs> Poor turtle. Um, caught. Yeah. I mean, dude, they this the one turtle time. Back. The turtles bite, man. They, they want to eat, too. 
That reminded me, man, this one time, I that was me and my dad saying we'd always go fishing, and I went to visit my dad in Missouri, and I was just cranking on this rod. I was like, Dad, Dad, and you know, my dad comes running over and shit, and he's like, you know, juggling two beers. And <laughs> Your dad's going. <laughs> he's sitting there, and he's, he's helping me get it in, and it's a turtle, and he instantly gets pissed off at me. Like, it was my fault <laughs> that I caught the turtle, <laughs> because he then had to reach his hand in there to get the, because I didn't, it didn't bite it. I just happened to snag Sorry. it. Oh. No, I didn't swallow it either. I just happened to snag it, and my dad was like, I'm not leaving that hook in that turtle, and he was basically like, you know, this thing's going to bite the shit out of me, and it's going to be your fault. He was so pissed. Why is it but, your fault? Because my dad was drunk, dude, and now every time I go <laughs> fishing, dude, all <laughs> I do is catch a turtle. All I, I do, the only thing I catch is a buzz when I go fishing now. Like I have literally had one, <laughs> one experience of fishing, and it was in the United States of America, actually. It was in Florida. Um, and I'll never, ever touch a fishing rod again. This was my luck, right? I didn't catch any fish, but I caught a fucking pelican, right? I don't know if you've ever seen what? it. This is true. <laughs> true story. I'd never fished before. <laughs> never fished before. I was out with some buddies, right? And we were in St. Pete's Beach, which is like a pretty classy, nice area. And we were beach casting because this guy's like a proper fisherman. You know, he goes out yeah. Robson Jerome style. You know, he's out there extreme angling and whatever. I don't know who that is, but sure. I used to show on TV, Extreme Angler. Um, Ray Mears. Now doesn't. I know why I canceled my cable subscription. <laughs> right on, anyway, man. Right on. Anyway, long story short, I've baited up this thing. We've got a little fish stuff. I'm casting out and always going well. If you've ever been down to St. Pete's Beach and the beaches in Florida, these pelicans are like fucking pteranodons, like Jurassic Park yeah. flyers. That They're like 18 down. feet tall. Yeah. Man, they, they take your arm off. <laughs> Anyway, I'm casting out, you know, just not really doing much at all. I just I stuck my rod in the sand and was just sitting down at that point there. I'd kind of given up. Anyway, a pelican comes down, swoops, picks up whatever is apparently near my thing, but but swallows the thing as well. Yeah. So I've now got a pelican <laughs> stuck on the thing. True story. Just drop so the rod. Done. Drop the rod. Can you be I'm any done. more awesome, Gary? Can you be <laughs> any more Shit. awesome? Your very the first time. Was- the rod was dragged across the beach, but then the pelican was grounded because this thing was fucking choking on whatever the hell was down its throat, oh panicking. God. So two, like, burly-looking Floridian men sort of, you know, immediately took it upon themselves to wade into the shallows to get this pelican. And one of them's got their hand, like, pretty much down into this bird's rectum through its mouth, like, yanking. <laughs> shit. And being the typical British person that I was, I just... <laughs> True story. I pretended it wasn't my rod. And just... <laughs> I don't know if it was like a national state bird, like the Golden Eagle or something. So I just left it. I'm and I've never fished since. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was picturing everyone holding up their tiny ass fish and Gary's got a kid by the. By I didn't take the bird home. To be honest, I'm assuming that the bird was fine. Like you know, this guy was obviously experienced in pulling things out of pelicans. But yeah, I mean, oh, I've, I've never touched a fishing rod since. Damn, Sh- shy dude. little Englishman. He's like, that's nope, not oh, mine. Oh my what's, god, what's that's fishing? amazing. <laughs> well, no, because the rod got dragged out of the sand and dragged like across the shore down to the other bit. So it, it wasn't evident that it was mine. So I didn't have to take responsibility or accountability. <laughs> Just let it go. Done. He thought he was going to go to jail for catching a pelican. (laughs) Fishing is a weird thing, right? Because all the media, like if you you read books, if you watch TV shows, if you watch movies, fishing is a transcendent experience, right? It's a way to bond with family. It's a way to relax. It's it's almost a meditation. But when I go fishing, I just get fucking bored. Like it's a boring thing to do. It doesn't matter if I'm fly fishing, which I – some asshole convinced me to learn to do, and it sucked. It doesn't matter if I'm fishing in a river, fishing in a pond. The only way I like it is if I'm fishing off the back of a fast boat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with, like, 18-foot rods that are supposed to catch, like, swordfish and shit. Because normally I'm not actually fishing. I'm just drinking beer. <laughs> I was yeah, going to say, it's no. usually just that an excuse awesome, to drink bro. beer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> This was a grounded experience and one I'll never do again. But uh, more power to you, basically, for taking yeah. up the hobby. It was great. Going back again Saturday. So next Saturday, we're going to do it again. Taking the whole family. Good on you. Good on you. Yeah. Awesome, man. All right. So let's get started with some revolver topics, shall we, gentlemen? We got a very that hot a button topic. topic. <laughs> no, it was just, you know, it was just fucking around, man. Fishing. Fishing. That's the new topic. Fishing or you burden? 
It depends. Like, <laughs> yeah, Gary yeah. was burdened. I want to go burden. What's that? Ask Gary. <laughs> this isn't even a, a pop culture show anymore. This is a fishing podcast exclusively. Fishing. <laughs> <laughs> All we talk about. Next week, we'll talk about bait and tackle. Yeah, I was gonna say what what was in your t- what was in your tackle to catch that bird? What were you what kind of lures you have on there? It was uh, it was like a little wooden sparkly thing. I don't know. Whatever. You're supposed he, to whatever. fish with like pieces of bread, you know, they love bread like I don't whatever Phil put on the rod. I I had no experience of what I was doing. I was literally a participant in that bird catching. I had nothing to do with it. Phil set you up, Gary. What do we got for topics today, Beasley? Fortnite is notably grabbing the PUBG formula and running wild with it. What will be the next game or franchise to jump on the Battle Royale bandwagon? This is your topic, I believe, Brian. Yeah, so this was all over the news this week is that Fortnite, you know, basically put a Battle Royale mode inside their game. Uh, a game that just went into basically early access this summer. Uh, me, Wilson, and I think all of us have played it. All yeah, of us have played, played it to some extent or another and enjoyed it, but Kind of bounced off fairly quickly, I noticed. Uh, but then now they've added a uh, Battle Royale mode where uh, you have a Battle Royale version of the game, but you still keep the building aspects. So you can build a base and uh, still do like the, you know, Battle Royale. So I thought this was interesting. Notably, Player Unknown is very upset about this, but I don't really give a shit. Uh, what I want to talk about is who's going to be next. Like, who's going to be, What's what franchise or game series that you really like? Who's going to adopt that Battle Royale mode, right? Because this is a cash cow. If you look I'll tell at Steam, you who's going who's gonna, to uh, grab it first. If you look at Steam right now, Beastly, it is top of Steam. It's making more money than people can count. League of Legends? Like cocaine dealer in the 80s money. That's what we're talking Damn. about. Damn. <laughs> Can't confirm. It's a lot yeah. of money. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's the first time that a non-Valve game has been at the top of Steam. Right? Yeah. Well, but what what franchise, what what game series that you love? Do you think, or n- not even love? Mm. What what, yeah. what franchise do you think is going to adopt this and be successful with it? Or uh, I'll tell you who this. I think is yeah. going to do it. Um, and, and this company has already shown they're willing to change with the times for whatever is popular. If you guys can remember back when Titanfall came out, when Destiny came out, they all in- introduced this new mechanic of wall running and and double jumps and it was yeah. very especially when titanfall did it it was so new and so fresh and it felt so good especially with the gunplay and then all of a sudden you see activision and call of duty with advanced warfare with this jumping on the bandwagon and, and, and kind of trying that out because these other games had seen prominence and, and success i think sure. call of duty i think call of duty will try this i really do i don't think there will be any set it up qualms. for me basically how's it going to work in a call of duty game i think if they were to do it they would have to create a call of duty with traditional multiplayer forego the traditional single play single player mode and oh. just create yeah and create so this you wouldn't replace zombies you'd replace single player i think single player is probably the mode that gets played the least wow i would um, see i if I were to do it, if I were Activision, I'd replace single player, that- keep the regular multiplayer, and for that one year, replace zombies with this, with this, or even maybe have a fourth pillar on a Call of Duty. That that may work. I mean, I, I, but the thing is, I think that they would definitely try it. The only difference on, on the formula would be to add items that the player can use in non traditional means in a Call of Duty game, and and make it more of an open world, an open landscape. Yeah, a map so it'd be a big really, change, really right, big. for Call of Duty because it would Call be of Duty maps change. are really tiny. So they'd have to design, they'd have to design a bigger map. Would they have a hundred people players in the map, or have fewer and make it a little more? No, action-packed? they'd have fewer. They'd have they'd to have. have, to have fewer. I, I think forty to sixty would probably be the sweet spot for Call of Duty, uh, because you, as you see, they they're able to get that into modern consoles and PCs nowadays with ease. So I'm thinking forty to sixty would probably be the sweet spot. Do you keep the loot aspect, or do you build Absolutely. a custom loadout and drop See, down? I, I, think I don't, it, I don't know. I mean, it's all can Call of Duty. I just that's, that's something to me there isn't resonating. I just don't uh, feel I, like first-person shooters feel like a battle royale environment. I know that Islands of the Nine is is going to be doing that, and that is kind of a, an FPS. I prefer the first-person mode. First-person too. Yeah. I, I I like it. But, but historically, battle royale games have not been first-person shooters, and I guess the hardcore crowd, whilst people do climb the FPP servers, 
do you not think that there is, is, is still like a, a I guess a hardcore audience that wants to see Battle Royale played in third person? Because for me, I, I feel like we're kind of looking at existing franchises, but PUBG's come out of like mods and things that have been built out. For me, I think there's going to be an evolution of the franchise, and we're going to see a triple A version of PUBG, whether it's you know the, obviously different names, etc. But I think there's going to be a specific game built around the Battle Royale with a single player component, etc. That is its standalone franchise. Well, think about it. Like you, whether you like Call of Duty or not, you know that when you go into multiplayer, that it's going to be a clean, clean as in it's going to feel clean. Like it's going to control right. good. You know what I mean? Like it's going to feel good. And you know, like sometimes it's a like, triple A title. It's a triple A yeah. title. You know, like, and sometimes it, it on uh, like... yeah, yeah, it feels like it. And like on PUBG, sometimes you feel a little sluggish. You get caught on shit. You know, you should. You should clearly be jumping over something, but it's not letting you. You know, little things like that that kind of make the game clunky and slow it down. I mean, could you imagine, though? Like, like these guys are saying, I also enjoy the first-person mode much better on PUBG. But if it controlled, like, Call of Duty in first-person only... And I mean, like, think about it. You could you could totally rip off the, the drop-in from a plane, because PUBG mm -hmm. isn't the first game to do that either, by the way. And Call yeah. of Duty has been known Arma. to have planes dropping things in multiplayer modes. Yeah. Just change the content. Bombs on noobs, what's up? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> you drop in, you can already pick up guns off the ground in the game, you know what I mean? So, I mean, it's a similar process. Like you said, you'd have to change the vastness. There would have to be a lot of net code written, so to speak, for a game of that size, but... You could have people drop in, you could pick up equipment, whether it's extra grenades, flashbangs, whatever. Um, you could find random weapons or even perks. You know, oh, perks man. would be like the end all. Like, you know, like when we're like, oh shit, level three helmet, backpack, and chest. Like, I'm good. Like, I got my juggernaut, quick draw, and marathon. I can run forever. You know oh, what like I mean? That. Like, you, cool. know, like the, you know, shit like that. I think it would work really well. And I enjoy the first person aspect of it. And I've always said, I think actually, Briar. The first time first person was available and we jumped in, I think you even said, could you imagine Call of Duty type feel, oh, really? smoothness, and controls with a with this type of game mode? Yeah. I, mean, I think it would work really, really well, guys. I mean, look at all the things you can do in Call of Duty now. You can call attack chopper, choppers and all these other things. Where oh, my God. That? Imagine if you could, you could find oh, that in the shit. world. You know, you, you go oh, into man. this abandoned house. You're selling me here, Beastly. Imagine, okay, so imagine this situation, right? Instead of it be in a loot game, it's a much faster experience. You go in with the, you build a loadout for for this. You drop in with your loadout, so you don't do any of the looting. It's a much faster experience. The The slow part of uh, PUBG is gone. The slow part is gone. You just jump Gathering, in with yeah. your guns and your loadout and your kill streaks. So you go in there and you get five kills. All of a sudden you're ca calling in a chopper or you get three yeah. kills you're calling in a UAV, then you're calling in a chopper, then you're calling a you know a, this needs to a gunship bro. in. Oh my god, that would be amazing! It'd be so Call much fun. Of you back, man. It could be. It would be much faster oh than a game of PUBG, right? Because in PUBG, there's like a ten minute looting phase at the beginning. Mm -hmm. In in this scenario, you would just jump in with all your shit, and then if you got a kill streak going, then all of a sudden you're, you're you might wipe out. 30 people, 40 people. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. To me, it right. feels that, like other awesome, games man. Other games have tried it. Like Division was a AAA that tried to do PUBG in effect. You know, the survival. That was a survival mode more than a battle royale, though, wasn't it? What was it? Last Man Standing on a map. You know, and what was it? Like 20 people on that map? 24 people? I yeah. don't know what survival had there. Like that. So there was There were survival elements and Last Man Standing elements with a bit of PVE involved. But... That kind of had spike popularity, but didn't peak off. I feel like PUBG has reached such a critical mass now that it's going to be difficult to dethrone it with something that that is coming out. The only yeah, but they I see think, that money, they want it. They want. And, and, and you know, I feel like Activision, Blizzard <laughs> could do, it. do anything to get it. Blizzard could potentially pull something out that would. Do Your it. money could be my money. Well, yeah. I mean, Gary, if, Gary, if you think of all the possibilities, right? I mean, Call of Duty has a long lineage of games, and most of them have seen lots of success. What if you run into a, a barn, and there's a cage in the back, and you run up to it, and you hold down square, and you open up the cage, and a dog comes out, and he's your attack dog, and he stays with you, kind of like they did in Ghosts. What if they just know. add different different kinds of crazy perks like that? It would be I amazing. Can see, I can see Call of Duty doing something. I, it would be amazing. So That's what, why it's the first thing who, that came to my mind. Who did Call of Duty this year? It was Sledgehammer? Sledge, yeah. All yeah. right, so Treyarch is next year? 
Yeah. And then Infinity War is here after that. So do you think Infinity you War think, probably. You think it'd be Infinity War? You don't think they could build a mode like this in a year? I think they can do it. I think they can't. But then again, Brian, you're going to really? take into effect that these are three year development cycles. So, yeah, anything that's but going on for the first 18 I just months. I feel like it fits in Call of Duty so well. It does. That's why it's the first thing that came to my mind. All right. Who know. else I, Who I, else has got an idea here? I, I don't know. If you're doing Call of Duty, I'm, I'm kind of semi on board. I just feel like. If you're going to do modern guns, it's been done. You know, it's not been done in a Call of Duty way, but if they did it in a historical game, like if they did it in like Vietnam or if they did it in something that was like, you know what I mean, jungle environment or an urban yeah. environment, something that was different, then I think maybe you've got some leverage. But I don't know. Would people play a, a survival Call of Duty or a, a Battle Royale Call of Duty? I think it would spike. I think that's what PUBG brought to the table is they ditched the survival bullshit. And they yeah. just made it, they made a much more action-packed version of Battle Royale. Yeah. I think that's where the success comes from. Like they just they ditched all the you know I'm getting sick I'm I need to eat I need to I need to yeah. spend an hour to find a gun they ditched all that and they just they streamlined the experience and made it much more palatable to everyday gamers. And it, and it honestly works really well with the Call of Duty universe gear if you think about it. I can't right. imagine them. All right, let's stop. Let's, let's get off point, Call of Duty. I want to hear the next suggestion. Wilson, you got one. I was I was thinking that, you know, we had kind of mentioned the division with doing their survival thing. I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to revamp and do something similar again that is different from survival because they've definitely proven that like they're willing to kind of go with what's trendy at the time as well. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a revamp from that. Um Gary, would it work in World of Warcraft? Would it work in would it work in WoW? Huh? Parachute, parachute in find your spells and shit and your you know it's not really no? a, a pvp <laughs> game i mean it would be great to have it in an mmo um right. i think you've, you've seen things like elder scrolls have got like a battle island yeah. and guild wars has like world versus world so that you have seen things like that where it's mass scale eliminations count kind of game mode um for me i think it would work more in something like a rainbow six style thing or like um what was the other thing tom clancy's wildlands something like Ooh. that where you've Ooh. got like yeah that'd be nice yeah. I think maybe like a Tom Clancy game cuz Tom Clancy Well, Division name The Division is a Tom Clancy game. People forget that. And I think, you know, they did the survival. I like that idea, Wilson. Is uh, they did the survival mode. The survival mode was fun for a little while. Some of the mechanics wore on me after a while, right? It's always mm. freezing to death. It just kind of like that wasn't fun. I want to shoot shit. That's what I come here for. Right. Um, but if they were to streamline that experience where you jump into the division, if that was the PVP mode of the division two, how cool yeah. would that be? Right? Like, I mean, I'd have that great something. big open world. It's an urban environment. You could, you know, if you just played the PVP game mode, you could fill it with guns or you could come in with a custom loadout. There's all sorts of shit you could do with the division. That, see, that's want... custom made for it. I'd want to see something different, though, and, and for me, like, a game that's uh, another AAA game, Ubisoft game, that has had development issues and has, has tried to adapt or reinvest is For Honor. And for okay. me, something like a medieval-style game or, like, a game where it's got, um, you know, timeless warriors, so you can go in, like, samurais, vikings, whatever, go out there, yeah. and you get thrown out into an aggressive, hostile wilderness where you might, you might come across a pack of wolves or lions. So there's PvE danger that's constantly roaming, but you've also got the threat of at any point you could end up in a for honor style 1v1 brawl or 2v1 but then you know everyone else is a hostile it could end up in a descended sort of 20v20 fight in the middle of the arena at the end oh, so it's not yeah. just who sees who first it's also who sees who but then who can be tactical enough to defeat someone in combat right i think that's different enough and it's all be, melee weapons it, as opposed to shooting yeah or like if you're a spear thrower you've got the advantage of range but then if you get flanked you've got fuck all you, you're dead you yeah. know what i mean so there's this, to me, that would be different enough to PUBG. It's not just more guns. It's actually something completely different that fits yeah. the theme of the game. I like that idea. That's That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, it actually does. I can't believe a I'm going to suggest this and Beastly didn't, but The Last of Us seems like a no-brainer for this. You put yeah. in... You drop want, in 100 it, people... <laughs> <laughs> you drop in 100 people to The Last of Us, right? And they already... With their multiplayer, they already had this kind of set up where you're... You're kind of providing for your community and you're adding to mm -hmm. your community. Gathering like if supplies. they brought that forward in The Last of Us 2 and put in some kind of survival mode where it was like a, you know, like a PUBG experience, 
The controlling is already there. The looting is already there. You already loot in Last of Us multiplayer. Like er all the things are there, but you bring in the the Last of Us weapons, the Last of Us combat, uh, the Last of Us world, which is super interesting. Maybe you keep the zombies so that yeah. not only are you fighting other players, but there's also these really dangerous ass zombies running around. Yeah, like I, I can see the Last of Us doing this no sweat, and in Sony. I would think it's kind of desperate for this because Xbox has um, PUBG coming. PUBG, yeah. My, Sony sees this; they want some of that, some of that money, but they don't have uh, they don't have anything in the works that I know of. I think The Last of Us Two would be perfect for this. That would really work yeah. as well because, like My you God. say, the electric fence wouldn't be an auto kill. It would just be that there's clickers walking out there. So you know, oh yeah, that works perfect. At that point, at that point there, you're out there with bloaters and clickers. So you can live in the red zone, but it's becoming increasingly more populated with zombies and hostiles. So yeah, you're, you know, you're you, burning up ammo, you're burning up armor. I mean, that would be surviving out there. That would be oh my god. I'd like to see as well. What's that Skull and Bones, that pirate game that came out um, at E3, Ubisoft, where it's like for honor at sea, effectively. You know, you've got like Jeez. a pirate crew. It looks like no, it looks like Assassin's Creed Black Flag, but right. they've taken the 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 boat combat and put it out. If they had that game where it was like team oriented, so you spawned in with a squad of like four or five on a pirate ship, and you've then got to like find the other squads that are out at sea and take them out and board them and fight them, but rather than being like a sixteen person map, it's now like a, a hundred person map. So it's real high seas battle. Like I'd love to see. I, I just want to see different things. You know, I just don't want to see futuristic. I'd I'd, I'd take medieval. I'd take pirates. I'd take whatever you want that's different. What about uh? Briar, when you said Last of Us, it kind of dawned on me. Um, what about DayZ? That's going into beta. It's supposed to be releasing into beta soon. If anyone's in the position to change the direction of the way a game is going it's to true. revitalize it. It's not... Because, I mean, they've they've sold a shitload of copies of that game, but the problem is, is that that property's been sold so many times that there's a lot of people that, you know, still own the game and have the rights to the game. And, you know, to get new people to buy the game, if they could code the game good and just make the game work, dude, it'd be amazing in DayZ and kind of the same thing. Like, I feel like DayZ has ruined their reputation. You think so? Yeah, I feel like... I feel like I'm giving will... them one last chance with this beta that's releasing, and then that might be it for me, man. I put thousands of hours into that game, yeah. and it the potential you, is so good, dude. The potential is so good, but like, you make a good point, man. I feel like, you know, they have kind of by selling the property multiple times and just kind of leaving that game in limbo for as long as it did. But years, yeah. yeah how long has it been in alpha? What, like seven, eight years now? <laughs> like... Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how long, but it's. Out of years. This could be the one thing that they need, though, is my point. Like, what you know, a lot need, of people though, are... I, I, I support this. I, I'm with you, Wilson, but they also need to show that they are actively developing on that. Yeah, game. yeah, I agree. Because that's the impression that I get, is that they've they've abandoned cashed it. in and abandoned it. Yeah. And if they did create a, a Battle Royale-style mode in the game, everybody who owns it and people looking from the sidelines would just say they're trying to cash in on what PUBG's doing. That's what people would say. Well, that's what everybody's going to say. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's what that's people what are saying about Fortnite right now. But I think Fortnite is it's brilliant for them to get in when they are. Yeah, they're yeah. taking a little bit of heat for cashing in, but they're one of the first ones with AAA development to build this kind of gameplay. You know, like you go into Fortnite. I haven't played it myself, but what I under, from what I understand, it's actually really good. You go into the yeah. battle royale mode of this, and it's really fun. And the option to build a base and defend it. Is actually really fun too. Do you know what else is really fun? Is that you can cross play PSN and Xbox. No, you can't funny, anymore. Wasn't it? You can't oh, anymore. For, yeah. for two, two <laughs> seconds. Yeah. Can you yeah. believe that, man? Can you believe that? Did we even talk about that? The fact that, you know, for people that don't know, when that game first launched, the, um, the, the Fortnite Battle Royale, people were like noticing that their kill feed looked a bit funky. Um, PlayStation users and Xbox users were playing the same map on the same server. Apparently, Epic forgot to disable crossplay. And uh, yeah. when Epic were like, yeah, when <laughs> Epic were like approached for comments, they were like, oh yeah, it's just a switch that we turn on and off. Like, you know, we've turned it off now, but we could turn it back on totally. It's like oh. it's that easy. Wow. It's like no networking, no nothing. Wow. It's just one switch. So that's incredible. I feel like we've covered this topic. We all know that the deal. Sony just doesn't want it to happen because they're in the lead. Yeah. yeah. 
But yeah, it is that interesting that change. it's that easy, right? It's, it's cr- Epic's really shown that it's that easy to do. It's it's crazy though that like Fortnite's getting all the flack for saying that they're PUBG is not the first game to do a battle royale. No, like Arma, the Arma Two was one of the first times I ever. I think I'm pretty sure they even called it battle royal battle royale. You know what I mean? Like, and it's just amazing to me because there's always going to be somebody that pioneers an idea, and then someone's going to come along and refine it. Yeah, that's just, that's I, just the way it goes every, every time. To my understanding, um, Player Unknowns, the the team behind Player Unknowns isn't so upset that they mimicked the game mode, but they're actually using the same engine, and they might have used the same code to enable like it. Like stealing it. assets and stuff like that. Epic, that's one. Yeah. Epic makes the Unreal Engine, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And you know, obviously, you know. Player Unknowns is running on the Unreal Engine and talking to Epic. And then Epic goes and makes this game that is in direct competition with one of their consumers who bought the engine. It's pretty fucked up, man. Yeah. But that's that, business. Yeah. It's business, man. That's just I mean, really it, there's a lot of people saying Lawbreakers, to, you know, stole a lot of ideas from Overwatch. I mean, yeah. there's even there's even a character that looks an awful lot like Farah and even says "Death from Above." You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, no, it's... if you make a game changer, you've got to expect everybody to clone it. It happened. It yeah. happens with everyone. Doom is the first time I really remember. It. Street Fighter was another big time that I remember it happening. If you make a game changer, everybody else is going to jump on that bandwagon. And PUBG, yeah, they're not the first. Battle, they're not the first battle royale game, but they changed the game and they they are making money hand over fist. And every company is going to jump on that bandwagon. Hell yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, Overwatch must be pretty pissed off at Lawbreakers for stealing their community. I mean, you know how many people are playing Lawbreakers right now, man? That game just <laughs> miles miles ahead. Oh, you're yeah, right. <laughs> so All right, so always. here we go, guys. Topic number two: Will we ever see a truly upgradable? PC style home console. Think about that. Will we ever see a company like Nvidia or AMD create console compatible GPUs? Could gamers enjoy the flexibility of a console that acts like a PC? I would. Imagine a partnership between Nvidia and Sony, which would allow the PS5 to upgrade its GPU or its RAM, keeping it competitive with the PC. Do you guys think we'll ever see something like this? We need to. We need to in Microsoft. I mean, We've seen companies try to do it before. I think I think I've spoken about it actually in terms of what I would like to see from it. But I mean, we've seen like Nintendo sixty four do the expansion thing that you could put in more RAM. We've seen uh, the Genesis do the thirty two X. So we've we've seen that. But my idea was always around uh, Microsoft trying to make PC gaming more accessible by by creating a you know game PC, whatever they want to call it, which is just like. You know, two or three tiers of, of super accessible, super common PC that is sold in a game store and is called, like, I don't know, you know, game PC approved. It's technology that they can build to a standard in the same way that when you're developing a console game, there's a standard set of hardware that you build to. So Microsoft could say, well, these are all the, the components that you as a consumer can choose from. And we've developed based on, on this component setup. So it just it narrows the market. I, I don't know. I think Microsoft could potentially do it. I think hmm. somebody will do it and it's going to be huge. Because it'll be too expensive. It'll be too expensive for the average console gamer to go buy. Uh, the problem is, is that you're gonna have to have these components that are modular in some way. Because you're not gonna want to have, you know, you're not gonna want to have a PC, right? It's not gonna look mm-hmm. like a PC. You're not gonna have have people opening up the side of the PC and and being able to access the wires and touch the motherboard and right. This thing is consoles are not user serviceable so it's going to have to be modular on an external level like so if you want to swap out the video card it's got to be basically an external module you want to chop swap out the cpu how do you do that externally you want to swap out the ram how do you do that you know like if you do do it it's going to be fucking expensive and well what i was thinking was partnerships you know uh companies like nvidia and amd are already partnering with nintendo Sony and Microsoft on some levels, and what if yeah. for the next, what if for the next generation, they were to partner with a company exclusively? What if they part AMD or Nvidia partnered with Microsoft or Sony exclusively, 
created the chips for for the uh, console, and also created proprietary GPUs for that console for the future. So how do you Where swap they, them out? Talk to me, like, logistically. How do you actually swap this thing out, right? Because you're buying this console, right? It, in modern consoles, like, you can hard – they're not user serviceable, right? You can, no, they're not. I mean, if no. you are – you can go to a guy who, who can do it, but, it, you know, if, if it's your first time, it's going to take you hours on hours to open this thing up and swap something out. I think it's so to do with design, this thing, Like, logistically. Well, here's if the thing, though. The... With, with console players, it, you ha it has to be plug and play. That's it. They, they don't want to mess with drivers. They don't want to mess with, you know, any sort of file swapping or anything like that. That's all. That's all easy to solve. Because if you only have two graphics cards options, that's all pre-built into the OS, right? And True. When you update your OS, there is, you know, a check. Does this have the graphics card one or graphics card two? Does it got graphics card two? Great. We're running with graphics card two. Yeah. The problem is to make that graphics card serviceable, right? That's what that, that's what you want to do, Beastly, right? That's what you're getting at? Yeah. You want, yeah. you want to be able to buy a PlayStation 5 with graphics card one. And then a year later, be like, you know what? I got a little extra money. Games look better with graphics card 2. I'm going to take graphics card 2 and plug it into my PlayStation 5, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you do that logistically without making it fucking expensive? I, I, I mean, don't the know. issue that I'm... you've got is is the build um, of It's all consoles. design. The it's design. The, the fact is consoles are, are generally system on a chip. Um, as opposed to typical graphics cards that, that we expect, like PCIe or like, um, again, for people that aren't technically minded, you know, the, the way that a graphics card and a PC works is that you just slot it in like a Lego brick. It just mm -hmm. slots in to the slot and works. In a console, the thing that you're slotting it into, the graphics card is like molded into it and welded, and it's not a typical graphics card. It will just be a chip, often with a fan on top of it. It's more like so, integrated graphics. On it's integrated. Intel. Yeah. Yeah, it, it would mean a complete redesign of the way that a console... Um, operates, Which they can do, be, but yeah. at great expense because having separate, having a separate GPU and CPU means more expense. That's why they do more. it this way on a on the consoles is because it's cheaper to have one chip that does both, and yeah. and one set of RAM that runs, you know, both your on your CPU and your GPU. Right? It's consoles. They don't have graphics RAM and and uh, CPU RAM. They have shared RAM for both. GPU and CPU. So well, this I, I would just, mean you'd have to have you'd have to have a graphics card basically, and it, you'd want to have yeah. it. You wouldn't want the motherboard exposed. Like if you went out and bought a 1080 Ti, you know that thing looks like a computer piece, right? If PlayStation were to introduce a 1080 Ti that you plug into your PlayStation, it would have to be you know completely shrouded. I would imagine. Yeah. Small, I guess. Would it go inside your PlayStation? Would it stick on the top? You know, how, how does that even work? It just seems like it'd be extremely expensive. Just make it like a Game Genie where you put the game inside of it and then it sticks out. The I like it. I like it. Yeah. You know, that solves everything, man. Just make it like a Game Genie. But, like, I, I think it's a wonderful idea. I think it needs to happen. But I think I'm with Briar on this one. I think whoever decides to do it, they really need to think about this carefully and I think, think about... fucked for it. <laughs> I think they need to like, cause what's, what's the difference uh, between like, eventually you get to a certain point where it's like, what's the difference between a PC and this new console? Like why, why wouldn't I just go buy a PC, you know? And like the problem is, seen, you know, like, we've seen people make that mistake in the past. Well, soon as they get, Steam mm -hmm. they, they get too expensive. They try, they try and hit for too much power. They get too expensive and nobody buys the console because you know, at that point, you're competing with a PC, which is, you know, also good for paying bills. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and, and like, the, the motherboard, you can upgrade stuff on your PC. You know, like, granted, like you were saying, oh, does this have graphics card A or graphics card B? What happens when graphics card C comes out? Do you then have to buy a whole new console with a motherboard with a PCI slot that now supports that graphics card? Like... And yeah. then again, that just yeah. raises the question of why didn't I just buy a PC? Because your motherboard could last you a long time. See, for, for like this, this topic to actually work, it would have to be a perfect storm. That's why I came up with it. This partnership between whichever console company and GPU manufacturer who creates these graphics processing units for these consoles, they have to do it a certain way. It had to be a design aesthetic that goes with this particular console. And as so how GPUs modular is this thing, though, Beasley? Because it, you know, like, 
Can you swap out the CPU? Can you swap out the motherboard? Can you swap out the RAM? Can you swap out the GPU? Like how many of these pieces can you swap out? And does each piece have to be modular? We saw in Razer make a uh, a PC, I think two or three years ago, they were showing it off at like uh, CES and stuff like that, where it was a completely yeah, could... modular PC where you, you had this like, you had this column and everything plugged into this column and every piece of it was like surrounded in plastic and then the components inside were surrounded by mineral water to actually cool them. And, you know, they abandoned the idea. They said, it's a cool idea. Everybody wants it, but it costs a goddamn fortune <laughs> because each yeah, one of these pieces is going to cost so much more than just to buy the regular PC equivalent. Yeah. And I think that's exactly why you can't do it on the console. The whole attractiveness of yet the whole, no, ever the whole, the whole, one of the main reasons people buy consoles over PC is that they're half the price. And if you erase that, we've seen so many companies fuck this up. Going back to Neo Geo, 3DO, I think fucking Xbox at one X is probably fucking it up right now. To be honest with you, I think that thing's mm. too expensive. You, when you start, Pushing your console up to that higher price range, you got you got a strong argument for just buying a PC instead. Mm. I feel like so the, you think the, that you're the, kind of mixing the two, and it's going to be hard for people to kind of differentiate what they actually need when a console's almost expensive as a mid-range PC. Expensive, and it starts getting more complicated. All of a sudden, I got to figure out which GPU do I have in my console, which. Which which RAM do I have in my CP in my PlayStation Five? Is it even compatible with with this new Call of Duty game? Mm. So I feel like, like the, the opportunity out. the opportunity there is for rather than trying to make a modular console, is for Xbox to do a branding play on it. And I, I don't know if this has been done. It might have been done, but thinking Microsoft because they straddle both worlds. Is there there isn't a PC that can just play Xbox games in the drive? Is there that you can just put them in and just play Xbox games? No. Is there I such a thing? Any no. PC you can play Xbox games if you have an Xbox. But you can't. No, just, he means uh, put the uh, disc um, inside the, disc, the actual no. disc. No. Right. So what I'm thinking is you have an Xbox. Call it the Xbox PC, whatever. Which is predominantly, it's just a PC for all intents and purposes. But it's set up in the way that if I put the disc in it will start the xbox and i have the xbox os and it will play and function as an xbox as per standard Aren't all xbox games coming out on pc anyway through windows store some of them are some of them aren't they're not all of them it's about which 15 one games it? it's not all of them you've got yeah, a lot of games which one is it uh gears of uh, sorry halo 5 um that master collection master chief collection okay. isn't um, a lot of like things that are, are exclusive. Halo Wars the exclusives is exclusives. Quantum Break, all that stuff. Quantum Break. Quantum didn't Break. Come out on PC. No, I think it did. that that is no, that no, is on no. PC. It is on PC. My mistake. Yeah, um, but some aren't. What I mean is, I can't Wars just walk in the PC. store and. Okay, look at um, Call of, Call of Duty. If I bought it for my Xbox, I can then bring it onto the Xbox PC. So my entire game library that I've got on my Xbox, I can transition onto the Xbox PC. I like so if that I'm idea. now. You know, I've got it already, so I can now take a step into the PC world. I like I that idea, though, PC. Gary, because I own a PC and I don't want to own an Xbox One X or an Xbox Two. Like, it's that, weird, this is an idea that sells people. less Xboxes. <laughs> I don't think it does, because if I'm a console gamer, I've got that. If I've got more money, this is this is instead of the Xbox One X in a world where I can just have an Xbox certified PC. Yeah, and you can good. upgrade the GPU and all that yourself. Yeah, and it's a normal PC, but it it's just a PC runs with the wow Xbox a One idea. OS, and you could just put it in. I feel the like they're drive. they're actually moving in this direction, right? Yeah, where Xbox becomes a software brand, not a hardware brand. Yeah, yeah. Wow. All right, what you may have next? sold me on. You may have sold me on that just <laughs> now. I, yeah, I think actually, that's what doing. the the next topic is one by our friend Ryan Wilson. What were some of the best, what are some of your best memories growing up as a kid in the 80s and 90s? Oh man, this is a good one. So, in my opinion, and this may just be rose-tinted glasses, but growing up in the 90s, you know, I was born in 84. I don't remember a whole lot about the 80s. You know what I mean? A lot of the 80s did carry into the 90s a little bit. Um, but I just felt like it was... You know, an amazing time to Worse. grow up, you know, very so much going on. Like America was growing so much, you know, whether it be movies, games, arcades, you know, anything with pop culture. Like, dude, even some of the I even put this in here. 
some of the snacks that aren't available anymore. You guys remember 3D Doritos, man? You guys remember those? Uh, 3D Doritos, Crystal Clear Pepsi, High C Ecto Cooler, and like Ecto Cooler, Ecto Cooler, dude. (laughs) Green shit. It was so good. Why have they not brought back Ecto Cooler, dude? I felt like the new Ghostbusters was a perfect time to do that, and that shit was bomb, dude. And the the commercials that would have been good in it too. You remember the commercials, man? Like everything was all like. Kind of doing a playoff like Bill and Ted, every like in the nineties, everything was yeah, like man. tubular, radical, like the jean jackets with yeah, the sunglasses dude. and the attitude and stuff Love like it. that. Like, man. dude, it's such an awesome time, man. And and, and in my opinion, you know, green it was like, slime Twinkies. Oh, say that in the man, comments. dude, there's <laughs> some, there's probably gonna be some cool stuff in in chat right now. I kind of hear <laughs> you, man. And and you know what's fucking sad? I was watching the Joe Rogan Experience the other day, and nice. he has. He had Paulie Shaw on there. Fuck, man. I wish I'd never seen Paulie Shaw again. Like, I wish my vision of Paulie Shaw just I remained. Saw that. Encino Man, Biodome, Jury so Duty, oh, kind yeah. of Paulie Shaw, man. Because that's just shattered my, like, to me, he's still the weasel. Like, yeah. you know, that is yeah. it. I still got that. <laughs> Biodome. Yeah, man. I don't get shit <laughs> like that anymore. You don't get movies like that and that kind of just silly, irreverent stuff. Like, everything now's got to be edgy and, like, you, you can't just have something that's just silly radical fun like bill and ted you mentioned like that was just like such a good premise you know just to have two time traveling stoners and that's like a, a fucking summer blockbuster that's not like a weird <laughs> movie that you see like that's just, <laughs> was i the only one extremely excited in 1990 when the turtles movie dropped oh no bc yeah. i am with you Dude. man yeah I... man my little brother was looking in the sewers and shit my first mom had to one go right snatch him. Yeah. It's like the second and third one were. Second one was still good. <laughs> yeah, but the first Kino. one was so good that I was excited was. for the second one yeah. coming out. And like before I saw it, I was, I was psyched. Three I loved the shit. cartoon. I loved the toys. <laughs> nope. I loved everything Turtle, man. I used to draw the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the back of papers. I loved the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And that movie was so good, man. The second <laughs> one had Kino know? in it. It was there actually was, pretty good. There was a fifth turtle? Who the fuck was that? There was a girl turtle. Oh yeah, no, man, like what, cartoon. like the Yoko yeah, Ono yeah. of the Ninja it's Turtles? The, it's like, in the cartoon. Are you talking about April? No, he's talking no. about the actual <laughs> female Ninja Turtle. Yeah, I've never I, seen I that. learned about I this I think a month like, ago from my Twitch chat, and uh, apparently there was a fifth turtle. They they did like a reboot of the series. And Venus de Milo. Yeah, Venus de Milo was the fifth turtle. Venus the girl turtle. Thanks, Gray the Fox Twenty. Fuck. 30. I'm no, sorry, you're lying to me. This is this is this is this is like Walmart tunnels. I kind of no, think like... it was just Donatello <laughs> just decided to go through, you know, you transition. You stay away from Donatello. He's my favorite. <laughs> all right, Michelangelo. I, I'm man. saying that was a big staff. Maybe he was compensating for something. I don't know. All or he was a got... pacifist. <laughs> or he was just a pacifist and didn't want to kill anyone. Just saying. You know, maybe you stay away from my Donatello. He was my favorite. <laughs> Raphael was kind of moody. That's a a freaky ass looking thing, man. That turtle looks pretty freaky. I don't know. I think what we're experiencing is Mandela effect, and none of this really happened. This whole female ninja turtle. Definitely had. (laughs) She was was real. I'm telling you, she was real. Mandela effect. But uh, no, remember, dude. Even some of just some of the commercials, man, were fantastic, dude. Like you look at the whole. You know, um, Genesis does what Nintendo don't. Oh, you know, yeah, that whole the console war? Campaign. Oh. Dude, like, they it was one of the tooth, first... They were fighting tooth Dude. and nail. That's what I'm saying. It was like the Jerry Springer of commercials. Like, two companies just going at it. Like, what are they going to do next? You know what I mean? Like Microsoft it, it, and <laughs> Sony are all like, you know, Microsoft does something good. And Sony comes out and says, nice job, Microsoft. We congratulate you. And Microsoft does the same to Sony, you know. Yeah. Sony releases the PlayStation Pro, and Microsoft's on Twitter saying, we're really happy for, you know, all your PlayStation... Play- Pro players, you know, like nice job, PlayStation. Yo, back in the nineties, <laughs> yeah, man, they'd be what like, if they if they got a kick in in a commercial, they'd be pissing on the other one's grave publicly. They, yeah, it was man. ridiculous. They were they were so fucking nasty to each other. It was awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> did you guys have me, that, that Gary over that there? That was the greatest console. Yeah, we uh, did. War. Yeah, I mean, it was it was great. You'd get like an advert, which would just be Sonic the Hedgehog, like fucking mario over a barrel and that would yeah, just be like yeah. the advert that would yeah. just be next week well, you, you got mario taking commercial. a shit on on knuckles you know like 
Man, they awesome. must not have aired these I commercials see. in my area. And then yeah, Sony got into the mix with Crash Bandicoot. And Crash Bandicoot's outside of like Nintendo's headquarters, like screaming shit through a microphone or a megaphone. Uh, I remember that? How did you guys like never saw that? <laughs> it was like a, it was like a play on the Pulp Fiction gimp scene where Mario kind of just opens the door carefully and he sees like Luigi, Peach, and Toad just bent over a barrel. Like, it was just, it's, I, I saw it at least. It was just me. Oh. Yeah, that must now, have just aired there, over there the UK. Was something, there was or in my head, guys, maybe. I don't know. Just there was something in the 80s that, that occurred, and we were really excited about it as kids, that could never exist now. And it's really funny to think about it. I'm sure it's so innocuous, nobody's going to really remember it or even recognize it. But there are water guns out. I'm not talking about super soakers, which were just as awesome. Oh, the Intertex. Intertex. Uh-huh. Wow, Briar, you were right there with me, man. Oh, I remember these. Intertex water guns. We wanted them so bad, and my parents were, you know, ahead of their time. And my mom always said, "You never get one; they look too real." And I was like, "Mom, the kid on the commercial is in his front yard just spraying people. It's water." What? Mom and dad never got us a fucking Intertech. I love those the battery dad. operated These? ones that would be like, cute, yeah. cute, 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 cute. They were battery like operated. Real? They were battery op- operated water guns, and they looked. Exactly yeah, like, like replica real. weapons. Yeah, they were replica yeah. weapons. Nine millimeters, AK 47s, M 16s. They looked like real weapons. And they were the beginning of toy stores selling weapons that had orange shit on them. Yeah. To, I remember to, that. Because First, kids yeah. started getting shot by cops. Yep. <laughs> for brandishing these things. I am. Um, I was one the of first. Those. That was when that started. I don't know if it was made by Intertech, but I used to have one um, that was battery operated, and it was um, Han Solo's blaster. Ooh, it's amazing. Oh, man, I dope. used to have in the UK, man, because we're, we're like gun deprived, man. We're, we're like we yeah. can't just walk into Walmart and buy a gun like yourselves. Like we 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 have to like you know get it on the black market from a guy who knows a guy. But <laughs> I had this um this six shooter, this cowboy six shooter. I don't know if you guys had them, and you used to get like a an eight. It was like a well, self plug revolver. Um, it was like an eight shot magazine that had like gunpowder in these little red containers. Yeah, and you a cap put gun. it in and you <laughs> shoot a cap it. Gun. And yeah. Like, yeah. Send out a gun and smoke. You could like hold up a, your local post office with it. It was great. Dude, you um, could go get your candy cigarettes and your cap gun, and you were yeah, a bad yeah, motherfucker, dude. Do you yeah. remember those <laughs> the cigarettes yeah. that were wrapped in paper that you could like pretend to smoke and like? Yeah, yeah they, they had like, like powder in them. Around. There was powder. there were bubble gum. But bubble they had gum and powder, powder around the bubble gum and then paper around the powder. So if you blew through it, it looked like there's smoke, smoke coming out. And like you buy these for a six year old. Man, they were <laughs> screwing <laughs> kids over back then, man. Yeah. It was good stuff. Oh, this segment made me Our sad. childhood come on, Beastly, you know this. Our childhood is way better. Like, Hell yeah, man. We had yeah. we had so much cool shit. Now kids I mean, Toys R Us is going out of fucking business. Yeah, yeah, kids sell toys. Damn. Have you been to a Damn. Toys R Us in the past couple of years? Yeah. Like just for, okay, it's it's completely different than what I remember. There's Damn a fucking it. LCD television advertising every toy, and it's like, it, it's like a high octane Japanese commercial of just like, look at this, look at this, look at this, boom, 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 boom. All lights, the toys lights, suck. Lights, you know, they're like... all these like sanitized <laughs> bullshit toys. Like, you can't go and buy a bag of glass anymore. Bag of glass, that was good fun back in the day. I think it's anymore. different in the States, man, because over here... You can't you buy can replica weapons anymore. The guns that look like real fucking guns. Yeah. You can't buy that shit anymore. Out, Everything looks shout yellow out to Super and Soakers, orange. Though, man. Who Super had Soakers fun with Super Soakers? You can't yeah, buy... Man. I mean, even the action figures. The action figures, like G.I. Joe's, man, they were yeah. badass military dudes. They had their guns. All that shit is sanitized now. All of it is no, sanitized. It has to be gender-neutral action figures, man. And you politically have, like, correct. Politically correct. You, you can't assume their genders. You just said G.I. Joe. You have like... Yeah, like you know, G.I. They were Z. anatomically correct and everything. Damn. Yeah, man. My action <laughs> man had a big swinging bulge down there. I mean, it was mm-hmm. it was sizable. It made me feel inadequate as a kid playing with it, to be honest. I had packing. a Rambo <laughs> action figure that shot fucking rockets. They shoot like good three feet. Yeah, my human figures did that. I had, had a Dragon Rambo... Of- I had a Rainbow Survival. You can't have that anymore. You poke kid. your fucking eye out, Beastly. Yep. You might choke on that shit. <laughs> I, I did choke on my Dragon Blaster Skeletor. It shot. I was a kid and I shot directly oh. in my face and it went yeah. right in my throat. I mean, do you remember when there was crazes as well? He I mean, man, I, they I, made He Man metrosexual now. Yeah, that's some bullshit, <laughs> man. <laughs> that dude used to have swinging balls like on the action figure. Yeah. He was a fucking like mas- as masculine as they come. Now he looks like, you know, maybe he's halfway through a sex change. No man, Ooh. he man, he man has always been a questionable character. Are like, you kidding me? He turned black. You mad because he got he turned black, Gary? 
Huh? He turned black. <laughs> All right. Man. He starts off as Adam. He says, hi, I'm Adam, Prince of Eternia and defender of the secrets of Castle Man. Grayskull. This is Cringer, my fearless friend. Look. Huh? I'm saying, black or white, I think the guy sucks a dick. That's all I'm saying. I mean, look at the haircut. <laughs> the haircut alone, that is a questionable... I've seen that haircut on one other man, and that was Jimmy Savile. And the UK <laughs> watchers will know who that is. That is a Jimmy Savile haircut. When he messing with all them kids? <laughs> that, he, man, <laughs> a lot he of kids. was He called, was like the Bill Cosby. He was he, our Bill Cosby, right? Man. Oh, he was he the most masculine motherfucker ever. His yeah. name is He oh. Man. Yeah. That's, no, he those two like words man. mean the same That's fucking se- thing. Yeah. <laughs> it means That's fucking man, man. big swinging man. dick. That's like a, that's <laughs> like a double <laughs> adjective describing he's a he man. That's how manly <laughs> he is. He's twice the man. Right? Trust me, right? When the toy when the lights went out in Toys R Us, He Man and Conan the Barbarian got fucking physical. Trust Conan, me. I know oh, I, Conan. I'm, Briar the Conan comic books you... had had fucking <laughs> nudity in them. That's what yeah. I grew up with. There was some titties there in Conan. There was sex yeah. in Conan. Yeah, Conan yeah. was a pimp, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fast shit with his sword and then go swoop the lady up. You know what I mean? And like, and yeah, the, the, his... he take a picture with her. She'd be sitting on the ground holding his leg and shit. That Damn. wasn't his leg. That wasn't his leg. Like, beastly. <laughs> <laughs> Conan would literally save the bitch, then fuck the bitch. Like, that was yeah. the cartoon. Like, that was, like, was it was You know, back in the 80s, he probably raped her, and nobody said yeah. shit about it. <laughs> just <laughs> just like, fucking alpha. That was it. That was his, uh, his thing. Yeah, but Conan was fucking... Wasn't it his, like, his wife was turned to stone, and he was just making full advantage of that while she was, like, gone. <laughs> he was just... Kind of... Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to get caught. Cool. She's she's a statue. So it's not, yeah, his, it's not uh, cheating if Medusa turned her to stone or whatever. Like, man, <laughs> do you remember that theme song? To, uh, Conan. Yeah, that was it. Fucking, that was so good. To uh, Mr. Wilson, this is an aw- awesome topic. It, you just took me back so far just thinking about it. Yeah, this is one of the most fun, fun topics I've had. Now. But side note, I, I thought Thundercats was better than He Man, but mm-hmm. I still love He Man. Man, Thundercats yeah. was some feminist bullshit, man. No, and no. Please, He-Man man, was And Chitara was, like... was fine as fuck, man. She didn't even have a vagina. She didn't need one. She was still fine as hell. How do you know she didn't have a vagina? It could have been under the fur. Yeah, that's a good oh. question, Gary. I'm I'm curious. How do you know she didn't have a vagina? If I Google never... Chitara vagina, I bet you I'll get, 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 get a hit on that. You could probably find any result you wanted to about that if you search for it enough. You might not get... You might get conflicting reports. Yeah. I'm wrong, right? I've, got a logical, I've got a logical question here that I need answered actually on this topic, right? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, callback. Yeah. Splinter was their leader, wasn't he? The rat. Yes. Yeah. They all got turned into anthropomorphic creatures at the same time by that toxic waste. Yep. How did he know the Kung Fu? Did he learn it as the rat? Yes. Because if he didn't, what, so the rat learned the Kung Fu and then taught Amato, it to the turtles. Amato Yoshi killed his master. His The guy who owned Splinter, his name was Oroko Saki. All right? Amato Yoshi was from another school and came and killed Splinter's owner right in front of him. But when 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 Splinter's owner was alive, he saw him doing all his training over the course of years as a rat. And he was in the cage. You never seen the movie? He was actually doing that shit as as the rat. Yeah. And so when he got turned, totally he feasible. was a gangster old ass rat. Gary, I have never been more disappointed in you than I am right now. You should know who Amato Yoshi is. <laughs> I'm just Bullshit. saying, with suspended disbelief here to say I'm all I'm all for it. Once you douse so, some acid on the rat, he can I think, kung fu. You know what I think this is? I you know I'm I'm trying to boil this down. Why why do we have so much nostalgia for this time period? There was a transition period, I think, when we got over like the I'm a badass dude in the sixties and seventies, I'm a badass dude and I you know, I, you know, I'm hitting women and I'm, I'm mistreating people. In the mm-hmm. 80s and 90s, somehow well, you could still be a badass dude, but still be like, you know, cool. And now you can't be a badass dude at all. No. <laughs> there was like this transition and- period, and I think like, you know, we got that, we nailed it right in the 80s and 90s. It was a perfect combination. I think, Brian. I think King's got the best example there. We talked about Conan, like going in and you know saving the bitch and fucking yeah. the bitch. Captain Kirk, Star Trek, right? He'd yeah. save the bitch, fuck the bitch, then slap the bitch. That was his, yeah. like, he took it one right. step Right, you can't do that terrible. anymore, right? You couldn't even do that in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> he was they, a better guy. Then he'd leave the galaxy. He'd leave the galaxy. He'd be gone. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> dude, Captain Kirk's got kids <laughs> all, all over. over. Got yeah. green you talk about seeding the galaxy. You talk Hell about the yeah. Genesis Project. Yeah, yeah, Kirk's been on that for years. <laughs> yeah, Kirk didn't fucking play. And he would whoop the ass of an entire crew of people by just running and throwing his body into him. So he was a bad dude, man. You see somebody do that shit. What's yeah, this? Really? I think he, <laughs> he was kicking ass, man. 
dressed in the craziest ways imagine. He had, he had the right color shirt on though, man. That that actually carries some weight in the Star Trek universe. If you've got the right color shirt, you can go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. All right, what do we got next? That was an awesome uh, topic. I, I love want to stay one. on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, can, we just, can we just talk about fucking Star Trek and that's it? <laughs> Start, before we move on, we're going to move on uh, to my next topic, Death of the Cheat Code, but before we go, Star Trek or Star Wars, which, which one is your favorite, guys? And you guys let us know in the comments, too. It has Ooh. to be Trek. It has to be Trek. Of course. It absolutely has to be Trek. Star Wars is the popular choice, of course. But Star Wars is fucking Ewoks and puppets. Like, it's not. It, it's popular, but it's nothing. There's no substance. It's all flash. It's all I'm, I'm much more of a, of a Trekkie than I I love them both, but I know much so what, more about wait, Star wait, Trek. Wait, Star wait, wait. You're a Trekkie. Didn't you, you, didn't you call the transporter the transponder or something too god damn ago. it no i did this is a fact he did this listen, yes listen are we gonna Real. drudge up the past okay yes, we are we are god absolutely damn. we are favorite <laughs> favorite, <laughs> favorite captain for uh any of the uh shows oh i want to know if, if uh wilson's a trekkie or uh yeah i want to know too i'm a star wars kind of guy and i'll tell you why because there's a lot more lore to the star wars universe than what we've seen in the films i was more of a shadows of the empire comic book reader kind of guy you know what i mean the the fake ass han solo dash rendar whatever his name was yeah dash rendar and they let anyone write those stories is that the one where chewbacca died because a moon fell on him that was true wasn't it it could happen true. gary it could happen all right happens. stand in the wrong spot <laughs> no, i am a Moving star on. wars guy too i am totally a star wars guy that the mythology of star wars the religion of star wars if you I choose to just disregard the prequels altogether because they're terrible movies and they yeah, they're fucking horrible. So fucking bad. But when you talk about Jedi Knights and lightsabers and the Emperor and this battle between light versus dark, it's oh. so fucking epic. And yes. you know, pe people forget how fucking revolutionary A New Hope was. It was an amazing movie, and Empire Strikes Back. That shit, you know, it looks it's aged. It's aged well, I think, for yeah. forty year old movies, but it. You know, it's aged. The stuff they're doing now, too, I think fits perfectly with that stuff. And yeah. Like I to me, Star Wars. I'll I'll watch Star Trek all day long. I heard the new Star Trek yeah. series is supposed to be great. I'll watch Star Trek, but my heart belongs to Star Wars and the Jedi Knights and the Emperor and the that epic fucking battle between the Empire and the Rebellion. It's so fucking good. Plus Star Trek never made a game better than Knights of the Old Republic. But yeah, I've I've just been a, a star trek fan for years my dad got me into it back in the original series i've gone through generations voyager star Jane trek Wars, is just everything. a cheap babylon 5 ripoff oh get the Ooh. hell out of here with that let me let me ask you this basically how much yeah. how much star trek memorabilia stargate atlantis ripoff man yeah, uh, right. all, all the star trek don't you talk shit about stargate atlantis i love that show i love stargate stargate's amazing all the all the Star Trek. Do I have? I have a it's Stargate. In, I forgot that movie even I have a, Yeah, I have a <laughs> model. Russell of land. Kurt Russell. In my storage Kurt Russell shed. as well. He was I have a model of the, the original Bang of actors Enterprise. last week. Wait, we've got to look this up. Yeah, dude. It, Stargate's amazing. I like the newest one, the SGU, because it's more of like a modern day Lost oh, in Space. SGU but it's so good. Atla Atlantis was really good too. Shepard was a handsome man who played played his part very well in that. So. It was good. But like my question to you, PC, was how much more Star Wars memorabilia do you have than Star Trek? Because I know you got two balling ass lightsabers that you oh, busted that out when the power went out. On Twitter was so hilarious. Yeah, fuck, fuck you, Irma. Irma's <laughs> gonna stop me. I turned my whole kitchen red. Um I have a I, I have considerably more Star Wars memorabilia. I mean yeah, Star Wars memorabilia. And the reason I do is because every time I see something at Star Trek memorabilia i buy it and i send it to my father-in-law kate's dad yeah, he keeps he looking is... up transcoder on the internet and he can't find one <laughs> transcoders <laughs> does anyone have a transcoder yeah, so, I need a transcoder. if you're if you're in the mood for merchandise right you're looking maybe i want a little star trek merchandise maybe a little star wars and for i don't know am i gonna get a a really nice star wars replica pew pew gun that's about this big and Kind of looks like it's made out of plastic, even in the TV show. Or am I going to get it's a fucking a lightsaber? It's called a phaser. <laughs> phaser. It looks like a, a noisy cricket stun. from Blood Men in Black. It's a stun or cut this motherfucker in half with my <laughs> light I've sword. Never seen, I've never seen anyone look cooler holding a light sword, right? A lightsaber, if you pick that up, I mean, basically, you've probably got yours next to you. 
If he yeah. picks this up, watch him immediately lose coolness. Like, pick it up. No, but, got, okay. You got to look at you got to look at Beastie's video he posted on Twitter during the hurricane. <laughs> it was yeah. the absolute coolest video of anybody on the internet using a lightsaber. No, Check hands down. Beastly underscore. He, sa- underscore. he literally <laughs> saved his family with a lightsaber. It happened. Yeah. We have video yeah. proof. Irma <laughs> fucked up my entire neighborhood and uh-huh. all the surrounding counties. Who comes to the, who comes to the rescue? Beastly and his fucking lightsaber. That's yeah. who. Lightsabers, plural. Yeah, two of them. Look, yeah, okay. dual right. wield. I'm just, I'm more of the school of thought that for me, Star Trek was every week going to a planet and what do you do? You kill all the local indigenous aliens and fuck the most attractive alien on the planet. Whereas Star Wars, you kiss your sister. That's kind of as good as it got in terms Damn, of love interest. Yeah. He's really going there, Brian. Oh, he's a really hot sister, though. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Carrie Fisher was pretty hot back in the day in her <laughs> the, the thing is, right? <laughs> you don't know what happened when they got back to the ship. That's the unseen side of it. I mean, obviously <laughs> they had the little it. kiss before the swing, but yeah, that's Damn. the best part of it. You you make it up in your own mind what happened. And, and, when they and got back. Leia was Leia was doing. <laughs> There's a lot of two kinds of men days. in this world, yeah. Gary. There's the ones who jerked off to Carrie Fisher in the slave Leia uniform, and the fuckers who are lying about it. Carrie Fisher was a freak, man. I can't look at I think that was like one of the stuff? first times I found, like, like found my, like, I was like, I think I'm growing up because, like, yeah. Carrie Fisher looks hot as hell in that outfit. I, li- I like this new Return of the Jedi mm. movie a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was your favorite Return of the Jedi? <laughs> Why? Um, uh, I really like Jabba the yeah, Hutt. That was pretty cool. Yeah, well, that, was well, <laughs> that, was, that was the secret challenge of Return of the Jedi to see if you could nut before the scene went back to Jabba. <laughs> that was kind of it. Fucked up challenge, man. What if you yeah. fail? Because if you didn't, it was over, man. It's over. That was it, man. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a that. hard ejaculatory <laughs> memory to just yeah, shake away. Just just Jabba the Hutt. Try it. Let us know how it goes next week. <laughs> Damn, that's horrible. Uh, the well, the saw like pit, man. Although that's kind of a metaphor. Anyway. Yeah, but um, seven of the nine was hot too. All right, so <laughs> god damn it. The the next topic is the death of the cheat code. I wonder who's old enough to remember I, things like the Game Genie and Tips and Tricks magazines and doing incredible things in your favorite video game. Something that I think has kind of fallen to the wayside in, in the face of newer technology and prettier graphics. Whatever happened to the cheat code? Games like Contra. It's still alive. Basically, it's on PC. Open up that console. Start typing. <laughs> <laughs> games like Contra, NBA Jam, and Grand Theft Auto have big roots in cheat codes. There have been some games that allow us to use cheats to alter the way we can experience a game, but it seems that there are fewer games that support cheats over the past few years. Do you think the cheat codes were a fun part of gaming, and what code did you like the most? This is for the co-hosts and for you guys in the comment section. Dude, I'll tell you right now, I rented a Game Genie for the first time from our local Blockbuster. And, they rented um, it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they rented it out, totally. And uh, I tried it out, and I'm like, this, this is the greatest thing ever, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can change cool. the gravity in games and make Mario jump high as shit. I remember I jumped from the beginning of World 1-1 in Mario, jumped, floated all the way through the air to the you end. You got a preview and, of Mario 3. <laughs> yeah, basically. And, like, it... <laughs> It was cool because it was different and it wasn't like cheat codes and game genie and things allowed you to do stuff outside of the bounds that you would normally be able to do. Um, One of my favorite games for cheat codes was Goldeneye, man, because you had to do certain things to unlock those cheat codes, whether it be invincibility, paintball gun mode, uh, big head mode. Paintball mode. Yeah. Yeah, and it it was really cool, man. Like it wasn't quite like the game genie where you get the book, you put in the code, and if you fuck up one letter in that code, you got to delete everything, everything. And go back and re-enter that code. This was something that you actually had to work towards something in it was the like game. Like Halo so, skulls, kind of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You had to like beat the facility in under two and a half minutes, and like I couldn't do it. My buddy could, and then I could beat the Aztec level in like under nine minutes. So like we switched cartridges and unlocked codes for each other, and there was a lot of fun stuff to be had from that, man. Like, a lot of good memories of... There were some games I couldn't even beat if it wasn't for Game Genie, oh, man. Yeah. Like, Adventure Contra. Island. Adventure... I could beat Contra without... without Just because I played the shit out of it. Uh, I man, only that was ever like, rented Contra, and that game was hard as shit. 
But I knew that up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, A, B, start. Oh, oh it's that's, that's, the most, to my ears. In, that's the most. Was it A, B, or B, A? I think it was B, A. B, A, B, A. You got it. You had to figure it out. Anyway, but like, uh, the, like Adventure Island, dude, fucking game was so hard, dude. Uh, and I could not beat that game unless I had infinite lives. There was just, I wouldn't have seen the end of some games if it wasn't for cheat codes. It's back funny then. because it. it the cheat code culture kind of happened in the same time as the rental culture. So sure did. you'd rent a game for two days, and these games were hard. Like th- mm-hmm. It's not like today where you play through a game in eight hours flat. These games in the NES area, era and the Super NES Genesis era, I mean, they had – if you were to just walk through this content, it would take you an hour, two hours. So they had to be hard to extend the, the playable Replay time range of the game, game, right, is they had to be hard. Um, but if you cheat coded it, you could get through it in two hours, no problem. Right. So you would go rent a game at Blockbuster, your local video store. Then you'd go and look up the cheat code for it or put your Game Shark or Game Genie on it, and you could blow through that game no problem. Matt, I remember when it was like real big business. So I don't know if you guys had Game Master, Games Master in the States. Like we had it over in the UK, where like every week you'd submit a request on TV and then they'd have um, Patrick Moore, the astronomer with the monocle. He'd come on with like a, a little kind of like robotic, kind of look like Modoc kind of like CGI on there. And he'd like answer viewers' cheats as if like he was the all singing or dancing games yeah. master. Well, that we was had something similar. Show. It was yeah. called power play here. Yeah. And at the Jeez, end, Lord. the kids got to, they put on a Velcro suit, the kid who won. Uh, all the trivia questions would put on a Velcro suit and they'd send them through a maze where the wall was lined with video games and consoles and they could pull them off the walls and stick them to their Velcro suit. And if they got to the end, by the time the timer was up, they got to keep all that shit. It was amazing. It was called Power Play. What was the game? I mean, this is probably from the last topic. This isn't anything to do with cheat codes, but fuck it, I'm going there. What was the show that the kid used to put on like a fucking helmet and go into like a sci-fi video game maze and they'd have to like try to figure out how to beat like the the enemies in each room oh, I and know then what go this on. Was. What, what was that the name was of that? so good was it lawnmower g- man no i'm kidding gotcha? <laughs> yeah it was something like that uh, do you remember that show yeah, is it yeah, just it was a nickelodeon show Fuck, what was the name I, of it i don't know if it's a uk thing but you go in and it'd be like a fucking i don't know if yeah, it's they'd have to, like wade through like a slime pit and then like crawl up like a like an obstacle course it was like an obstacle course Awesome. I think Hugo's got it. Is it Nightmare? Nightmare, but like as in Medieval Knights, that was another one where you used to go in and be like a fucking court jester would like be like, this is room number one. How do you know the secrets to get through? Oh, uh, this like is kids- something different than what I'm thinking of. Oh, man. Maybe this was a UK thing. Yeah. ITV, yeah, it's UK, man. We haven't got that memory there, but that was so good. We were talking about like, you know, that interactive game show where the kids could go in and actually play a video game. So good. So I wanted good. to quickly talk about some of the cheat codes that I, I uh, dabbled in. Of course, the old Nintendo stuff was very special. Uh, but in the late 90s, there was a video game magazine back when there were more than like three magazines called Tips and Tricks. And Tips and Tricks, every month, they would compile the newest video game cheats. And they'd have articles about these cheats all the way through the magazine. When you get to the back of the magazine, every cheat that they had compiled would be like kind of in a glossary in the back of the book. So you never really lose any cheats. And I, I learned a lot of cheats from tips and tricks. And it, it's kind of sad in my mind, at least, you know, thinking about the good old days, it's gone now. But for me, uh, some of the cheats that I enjoyed the most, I'd probably say I'd go back to Oblivion. Uh, the Elder Scrolls Ob- Oblivion. That game, when I first started playing it, it was a lot. It was a very heavy experience. And after I actually went to Oblivion and beat the game, I learned about duplication glitches and things like that, where you can create items, you know, uh, limitless items and you can take them and sell them or you can use them that uh, made see, I the just like i like making shit i could blow up i like like putting too much shit into the world and then like i never did it in oblivion but whenever the duplication like code was there i'd like put the red barrels and see how many and, red barrels i could get and then shoot the red barrels and just, just see blow everything two up. frames per second like bop, bop, bop. <laughs> <laughs> But the very first cheat code that I ever saw that really changed the game for me was on the original Sonic the Hedgehog game. Uh, And I don't remember. It's up C, down C, left C, right is the actual cheat. 
And uh, basically, you can become any item in the game, any enemy in the game, any platform wow. in the game. And you can fly through the world, make limitless gold rings, and just you can pretty much be Mario Maker. You can create all new areas on any stage. And up, down, left, right was actually the... Um, if you do that in tandem with the original code afterwards, you could uh, select any stage. And so I had a, I had so much fun in Sonic the Hedgehog just creating new enemies in different places, putting ramps or putting springs in different places. And that's probably the game that really opened my mind up to the possibility and what really happens behind closed doors when it comes to development. How this why stuff do you, is always Why do you there. think they, these aren't in console games anymore? Because like, for the most it's part... Not. They're not there. Why do you think they kind of disbanded these? Like they're still in PC games. Like I, I wasn't lying. You can open up the console on most PC games. Yeah, and just type into type them, away yeah. and get cheat codes. Like, they're they're you know. in some games. Like they just usually disable trophies or like achievements and stuff like that. You think if it's you the do. trophy system that kind of well, it, it, it if could you be, do, that could be it. If right? if you do a lot of games that have trophies and achievements, if you use a cheat code it will say it'll pop up we, on we will disable your ability to get trophies and achievements you know if so if you care about that shit don't go ahead with it um do you think it's do i don't think, think they lowered the amount of playtime you got out of a game like if you went and got oh, invincibility sure. yeah in in ghouls and ghosts it was a hard ass game mm -hmm. but if you did it it's invincible well. you saw the whole game and you're like okay i saw everything what do i need to fight through this I don't I think, think you're that seeing them brought into games, them. like you're seeing them brought into games, um, but only for certain things. So Final Fantasy IX got a re-release uh, about a week ago with Tokyo mm -hmm. Game Show, um, and the so, repack yeah. that they've got has got all of the cheat codes built into it, so you can max out your character's level, max out all the skills, play the game at 400% speed, turn off random encounters. So everything that you need to play the game in a cheat mode is there. That is Same so as fun. Disney Afternoon Collection, going back and playing like Ducktales and all that stuff. It's got like rewind where when you die, you can just press rewind yeah. and go back 30 seconds. Emulator. Uh, you can save wherever you want, all that kind of stuff. So I think where it adds gameplay, you'll see it. But like you say, if, if you could just, I don't know, let's say Destiny. If there was a cheat code in Destiny for like maximum glimmer. You just buy maximum glimmer whenever you want or a cheat code to get max light. Like it would immediately diminish the game. And like Skyrim, I played Skyrim. Um, I didn't really like Skyrim anyway and fucking going to catch some hate here, but... I played Skyrim for about six hours, and then I was like, oh, if I put in this code, I can just get, like, full Daedric armor and a Daedric bow and whatever. And I'm like, oh, done. I've just completed Skyrim. So it, like, completely <laughs> diminished the entire game for me because it was nothing See, to See, I, I have the exact opposite experience, whereas, like, I did the same thing, Gary. I bought Skyrim for PC, the, the remastered or whatever, gorgeous, love it. Those are some of my favorite games. I did the same thing, man. I was like, Daedric armor, dragon armor right away. But... To me, it's using that stuff, you know, like yeah. when you when you create that overpowered enchanted sword and when you swing it and that asshole goes flying across the village, you know what <laughs> I mean? Like that's one of the, the funniest things. But like one of the most one of the most popular cheat codes that I can think of today is the Mortal Kombat blood code. Oh, can yeah. I say it? Can I tell you mm. what it is? A B A C A B B. Yeah, yeah. See, me and Beastly know. Like it's that that was huge, and that I had the was the Genesis version. I don't think I need that's it. The right? That's the Genesis version. Oh yeah, the Genesis version. Yeah, they didn't have it didn't on have the blood. Super Nintendo. Uh, it had sweat. Yes, yeah, sweat and and it's fake sweaty. fatalities. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like crappy stuff like Sub Zero freezing you and just hitting you, and you just fall into a block of ice. You hit so ABA, This stuff C, is all still there. Cheat codes are still. I mean, they were. Uh, Cheat codes were originally, they're not cheat codes, they're development tools, right? Is right. They wanted to test the game out, so they wanted to have, like, invincibility. They wanted to have all the, these codes were set up so that when you were testing your game, you could go in and, you know, skip right to the level you wanted to. You didn't have to worry about dying because you wanted to get to the certain part to see, you know, what you just developed. And basically, the, the cheat codes, they still are there, but they, they've hidden them or they've taken them out for the full retail release. You know? So, yeah. like, it, it's kind of funny, like, they... They were cheat. We called them cheat codes, but they're really just development tools. Shout out yeah. to, to uh, Gr Tamer talking about um, the tank code in GTA Three. That was the first Grand Theft Auto cheat I ever used, where you turn into a tank and you turn the gun around behind you, and you start firing the gun, and you actually can fly through the whole world. That was awesome. 
Good what stuff. What do we have for the next topic? Where are we bees good at? Good topics tonight. This is a this <laughs> really is, good. Yeah. This okay. Is very hot. Uh, Next oh, one is, uh, you know, with all this talk of nostalgia and stuff, because it's very been a very nostalgic episode, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. We're, we're really going back here. Um, games have come a long way since the old days, but every now and then, you know, you might kind of get the urge to revisit some of the old ones and see if they still give you the same feeling. Uh, more often than not, I find they do hold up. We'll find a couple of your favorite games, you know, back in the day that you may revisit that it just doesn't hold up as well. But basically... My question to you guys is, what were some of your favorite games growing up? And do you ever have the urge to go back and, and revisit some of those games? And I like, used to, Wilson, I used to have the urge, and then I started doing it, and I found that I, unlike your experience, they'd never hold up for me. Like, they really? never, they never control as well as I remember. They are never as fun as I remember. The story wasn't as good as I remember, because I think back in those days when I was playing Genesis and Super Nintendo and even NES... So much of the story was in my own head. I was young. I was playing the game. There wasn't a whole lot of narrative there. So I was just making shit up in my head. And, you know, going to play Take in the Forever Man. That game is fucking garbage. I <laughs> loved it so much. I loved that game so much. You're a badass undead dude with two swords. And I played that, I think, five years ago again. And it was awful. It was a bad yeah. game. So many. <laughs> I mean, there's some games like Super Mario Brothers or Zelda. Of course, they hold up because they're expert games. But some of the games, some of my favorite games from back in the day, Super Star Wars is another one. I bought Super Star Wars for the Vita. That game is fucking hot garbage. And that got like 9.0s in EGM back totally in the day. Totally disagree with you on that. Oh, Gary that game is Vita garbage. And was- Super Nintendo? <laughs> I heard Super someone Star buying Wars? something Super, in the Super and Star Wars is fucking trash. <laughs> That's still the shit for me. No. Man, Play you it again, Beastly. I have, it. I have it on Super Nintendo. I love oh, that game. Terrible. Immediately I mean, piqued like, my interest with terrible. Vita. I feel like the handhelds are where you can actually go back and revisit nostalgia games and have a good experience yes. on them. I wouldn't sit down. I mean, basically, it's about time for you to pull up the North Korean piece of shit that you call a handheld. My son was um, playing uh, Turtles in Time in the living room. It's in there. The the handheld, for me, <laughs> lets me still go back and have some of that moment because I'm not going to play. I'm not going to sit down and play Super Star Wars for like eight hours like I would have when it was a current line game. But if I'm on a train and I've got 10 minutes to kill and I don't want to play Pokemon Go or Fire Emblem Heroes or whatever shit block square game I've got to play, I can pull out my Vita, play Super Star Wars for 10 minutes, and it might be hot trash, but I've had 10 minutes of entertainment out of it. And that's how I like to experience those nostalgic games. It's just my own personal thing. The handheld has brought it back for me. Yeah. For me, a lot of a lot of my past, you know, I, I connect things with video games and music and Sometimes I just want to relive old moments. And, you know, back when I was a kid living with my older brother and Joe, shout out to Joe. Uh, and we spent every day together. We played every game together and, and we can't do it anymore. But I'll still pull out my Super Castlevania 4. Mm. And to me, it still looks beautiful. It still sounds amazing. Donkey Kong Country, still an amazing game. I'll even uh, play on my PS2. I played, uh, I think it was Monday. <laughs> I played Silent Hill 2 for 20 or 30 minutes just to remember what it was what it was like. Didn't age it's as so well as great. I would hope. It's beautiful. It's so great. Yeah. Yo, it, Castlevania it, 4 was awesome because you could whip diagonally, man. It was yeah, the man. only one that you could whip was, diagonally. Whole, and you could spin it around, Wilson. Let's yeah, you not could. You could do the little, like, you could fidget spinner with it a little it, bit, yeah, like, standing there. Man. You, you could, could wait whip, for your ride. Could you, uh, could you nay nay? That's the question. You could. You could. Yeah, you can. You definitely Absolutely. Can. I think Simon Belmont could nay nay. Absolutely. Fair enough. For me, He's for me nostalgia. Places. Because I'm so close to 40 years of age, nostalgia reaches back to consoles that some people probably never saw. But for me, they were late consoles like the GameCube and 64. To me, Mar- Super Mario 64 is will always be a classic game to me. And it looks the way it's supposed to look. And it feels the way it's supposed to feel. And when you pick up that, that 64 controller and you run around with the analog, it still feels special compared to playing with you know modern controllers today. I feel like that controller feels like garbage now, really. Play really Mario 64. Play well, Mario 64 with that Trident. controller. Like the, Dude, the I got analog it. stick there's on nothing, that. There's nothing yeah. better for that with game the than plastic, that controller. With the plastic top and like the, the hexagonal ridges in there, it's like it's not a smooth yeah. round surface. The way you have to move your hand to get to the D-pad, that controller it was revolutionary at the time, but uh, I mean, much better controllers have come out. Play, you know, play, play Mario 64 emulated on a PC with a real controller and you'll see the difference. 
Yeah, I, I have I, I have it on here. But for me, that that original experience and being able to go back to it, of course, that controller, you know, it's been 20 years. It, it hasn't right. stood the test of time. But when it came out and we walked inside Blockbuster Video and they had the kiosk and they had that controller up and you looked at that screen and you saw Mario 64. And you're like, what is this? And you grabbed it and you played. It was a magical thing. It was the first time any of us had ever experienced that. And I part of that magic still sparks in my mind when I grab that controller. Yeah, we got DualShock 4s and Xbox One X controllers and, you know, Steam controllers now, which have superseded technology from the past. But for me, a part of that magic still lives on every time I revisit it. So the N64 had, I'm, I'm with you. I It was cool at the time, but notoriously after a while had that loose, like straight hot dog down a hallway feel, man. Like where it... <laughs> yeah. It, and now this control, actually, this controller right here, it is doing something where the stick goes all loose and floppy. And I have compared it to, I oh, said, yeah, dude, my stick, stick, I said, my stick is going all N64 for flittle flop on me. <laughs> like, it's not, and, you know, because people just be cramming on them and you go over to your friend's house and he'd be like, oh, you got to use this controller, bro. And, it was, you know, it was all fucked up and you couldn't, couldn't yeah, move the right friends, way. You know what yeah. controller never got floppy? The Duke. That? The Duke never got the, the Xbox One. You see, the, the Nintendo 64 controller was perfectly hard. designed, right? It was perfectly designed for the small percentage of the world's population with polemia. So anyone born <laughs> with three arms was perfectly adequate, right, perfect. to play the N64 controller. <laughs> perfect. You know, that, that, that 0.01% of the world's population, they didn't have a birth defect. They were just born perfect for the N64 controller. Right. The fact that you knew the name of that off the top of your yeah, head. Yeah, that's crazy. Bulimia. Damn. Somebody's Bulimia, been watching Total. What about the chick with three boobs and Total Recall? Can she play it? Um, one more <laughs> thing. I got a question. Who here has played Streets of Rage 2? And who doesn't think that game holds up and stands the test of time? Because it is totally amazing. I loved it when I was a kid, but I haven't played it's, it. And it's not good. Is that the one with the little dude on the rollerblades? Skate. And the girl don't the, you, you know? don't you go there, Gary. You're not going to smash American for his history, opinion, okay? And now you're going to shit in his fucking you know, cocktail. Yeah, I'm not going to let him shit all over <laughs> our heritage. That's American history, goddammit. <laughs> Streets of Rage. Is that the, wait, wait, wait. Blaze was that the, actually, it was, it was a pretty, it was a pretty fair representation of the LAPD in the uh, early '90s, actually, because I remember you called in the police car <laughs> and they shot long-distance ballistic missiles at crowds. That was the yeah. one, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Was... It was way ahead of its time, to be yeah, honest. Man, it, was, it, was, it, was, <laughs> it was like it was telling something. Folks, right? It saw the militarization of the police. Yeah. Like, coming from is a fool. 20 years out. Yeah. <laughs> we, got yeah. some, we got some protesters. Just like, I'm sure there's one African American gentleman somewhere in the crowd, so we'll launch missiles <laughs> randomly <laughs> at them. I, I, I was more of a uh, double dragon guy. Um, you know, yes. no, those were I, those were my favorite um, Super growing up. Dragon, like, man. Yeah, Gold, I like the uh, Axe. Man, Golden Axe. Yeah, little, Golden Axe was good. Oh, just man. jumped on with the dwarves. Man, that's oh, so, a game so, that doesn't hold up though. I mean, that, that game does. plays terribly. Like if you, like if you go back, it feels so bad. <laughs> you gotta play. You gotta play the actual true arcade version, man. It still holds well, up. That's really what I did. So I was good. down in Florida yeah. about three years ago, and I was playing. I was. It was the same arcade that I went to when I was a kid. I was like, oh, they still have the Golden Axe uh, machine. So I threw a quarter in there. I'm like, damn. Times are rough. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know what I think still rough. holds up perfectly? And it's it's kind of games, but it's kind of not. A pinball mean. machine. Pinball machines, yeah. man. If you've got a fucking pinball machine, that's timeless. That's still the same gameplay experience you had when you picked up a pinball machine. Well, I'd pick it up. That's fucking ridiculous. But when you played a, a pinball guy, machine. Gary. Um, <laughs> the Adam, Adams Family pinball, or like the fucking it's very sought after pinball, like all of those pinball things. So yeah. was the uh, Twister one, or the uh, or not Twister? Um, oh, was it uh, Beast? Yeah, uh, no, from your grave. Wasn't was there a, uh, no the the Twilight Zone, the Twilight <laughs> Zone pinball machine? Yeah, that was it's good. Very, the ball that used to go spinning. fucking crazy. Oh, that yeah. was cool. yeah, that, that yeah, big spinning that. thing, and and dude, those were. And you said the Adams Family. I remember uh, Kiss pinball. You know, there were some banned yes. ones as well that were really good, and like. Gene Simmons' tongue would be all, it all come out like if you, yeah. you and, got, and like, a big you, high score. Used to let you cheat a little bit as well, but then if you cheated too much, it'd be like tilt, and then like it just be yeah, there, like, you were allowed to like kind of uh, like hit it a bit, yeah, hit the table. yeah well, and that every there, now and then the game would tell you a little bit too much tilt there. There's four of us here right now, and I guarantee you, if we were all together and we saw that X Men arcade four player, mm. we get on that shit and beat it. Or the Turtles game, we get on Absolutely, and beat it, man. Oh, I agree. That holds the, up. 
That holds is it up 60 very frames well. per second? God damn it, Gary. <laughs> I'm just asking. They didn't have PCs Probably when like these 15, games came Gary. out. <laughs> Can't use a fucking Zim on an arcade machine, Gary, all right? I'm going to keyboard and mouse fucking Wolverine. You watch me. <laughs> Bro, I'm so much better on keyboard and mouse than you with that joystick. I'm just saying, man. Like, I, look at all these buttons, bro. Like, look at, look at this yeah. versatility. See me jump and spin? Like, wouldn't even need to claw, man. I just, I'd have it. Yeah, you um, can't do that with a joystick, man. You gotta have a mouse. <laughs> but I kind of wanted to, like, like with my experience, like, so, you know, there's a lot of ways that you guys can go back and check out these old games for yourself. Um, you know, Wii U has an awesome marketplace for them. Your 3DS does. You know, you're going to pay. Excuse me, guys, I wouldn't just quite, for a minute. No problem. I would not quite call it like you're going to pay a premium. But, you know, sometimes you might pay more than what these games are actually worth. You know, you could always go to your parents' house, see if, you know, your old box of video games is still around there. Um, emulation's a big thing, man. And I know it's a very touchy subject, but, you know... Uh, there's people that do it on Twitch, and I think a lot of people are past the whole is emulation illegal thing. Um, I do believe, at least if you own the physical cartridge, you're at least allowed to do it. But there's a lot of people that will, you know, stream the game because it's easier to emulate it or they don't want to pay a premium. You know, a lot of speedrunners uh, will do Japanese versions of games because of the text is shorter, yeah. thus, you know, saving you frames. And they might not have the that version of the game might be, you know, worth $50, $60 compared to the U.S. version, so they don't want to pay it. But for me, it started with emulating and being like, damn, I kind of want, I kind of want this experience, like, on a physical console with a controller and on an actual television. So I started hitting up, you know, some flea markets and garage sales, thrift stores, sometimes Craigslist and rarely ebay because you're going to pay a, a premium on ebay but for me but for me it kind of started to where once i started revisiting these old games i wanted to collect them physically and it it gets very very intoxicating um yeah. when you're doing it because it's you're getting out there you're getting exercise you're going places i mean sam was even into it man like she'd be calling me like yo i just found this box game boy and dude wants like 10 bucks like i'm like yeah pounce on it it's boxed you know well, that's like, what i did with the vita know? man that's like for, for me the vita as much as mm -hmm. i love the console the mm -hmm. physical collecting of it for me like i i don't buy the game if it's digital like i will have i've got yeah. stacks of them there because I, I see the vita as a as a nostalgia console because, you know, it's something that didn't sell in large supply and it's something that in 10 years time, the games are going to be difficult to find. So for me, it's something that I, I like to go out and have and I like to, to own and hold. You know, it's, it, I, I can see where you come from with like, nostalgia games. Pounce now, Gary, because like you said, those are just going to go up in price. You know, that's the best time to collect for a console is b before it comes retro. You could find, if, if you want to collect for the original Wii, I mean, you could find games for less than a dollar. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it... It's the best time to, like, you know, anticipate these things eventually becoming retro. But for me, it was, dude, I mean, like, I was checking pawn shops. Like, I'd be I'd be cruising by and I'd see a pawn shop and I'd go, shit. And I'd take the next right <laughs> and I'd go in there. I'd give dude my number. I'd be like, hey, you guys get anything in. You call me. You know what I mean? Like, if you, you know, you could do your, your price thing. I get it. You know what I mean? But if there's anything that you guys don't want, you know, or you get it in, give me a call. And it became a really cool experience, man. Um, you know, and just like any other hobby, dude, there's a lot of there's a lot of pros and cons that can come with it, dude. There's a lot of shady activity when you get into collecting things. Um, there's a lot of fake versions of games out there. People are doing reproduction labels, so you could even yeah. you could even rip the label off a game, put a new one on it, and sell it as that, and they won't find out till they get home and put it That's in their NES. Like. Devious. I've seen it all. Oh, no, genius, dude, man. I've seen it all, dude. Like, uh, I mean, like people will go as far too as to burn the EEPROM chip, and I've, I'm okay. I'm gonna say I've done this, but not to sell video games. So there was a game called Sweet Home for the NES, and it was only for it was Japanese only, and it was an RPG. I can't fucking read or speak Japanese, but I keep hearing about how what an amazing RPG this game is. So people put out a ROM hack and translated it awesome but i wanted on a physical cartridge you know because that's how i was at the time so i busted out old computer with windows xp got an eprom burning program and burned took an old i think it was bo jackson's baseball because the the board matched up correctly to the board that would have been for sweet home and burned the eprom chip on there and 
made my own label, put it on there. I had my own copy of English nice. NES Sweet Home. Uh, I did it for the original Earthbound because Phil Sandhop did a translation for it, and uh, who actually worked for Nintendo, which was pretty cool. He jumped on that ROM and did a translation for everyone. But it, you know, with that, that's cool. That's the good side of burning EEPROM chips. You know, the bad side is. You uh, you just purchased a Bo Jackson's baseball game and someone sold it to you as an official Sweet Home, you know NES yeah, cartridge, yeah. you know, and that that's the bad side of it. But you know, and I've seen, dude. You want to talk about? This was probably the pinnacle moment that I realized that it was that the local retro game collecting scene in my area was getting a little too shady. Was I uh, would get on Craigslist not to not to purchase games or even talk to people, but I would look at the garage sale section because a lot of people would take pictures of the items that they had in the garage sale. And if I saw Nintendo games, I'd go check it out. Well, there was this one, and I knew it was just too good to be true, man. It was just all these video games. This is where you go. This is what time it starts. Why well, show up a half hour early and there's already six other people parked in their cars waiting for this garage sale to open up? <clears throat> one guy gets antsy. Goes, knocks on their door a half hour early, which is rude as shit, first of all. And secondly, there wasn't even a garage sale at that house. That was some other random collector that was just trying to deter people that Saturday to keep him out of his area. Mm. So some little old lady, some little old lady answers the door, calls the cops. She's got six cars full of unsavory looking people out in front of her house. Retro game collectors. Yeah, retro game collectors. Y'all want to buy some games, but like, call it, the cops, hon. We got nerds outside. Yeah, and this, <laughs> yeah nerds and uh, yeah. like shit like that, man. It's just oh, it's shit. really yeah, a man with tattoos and a baseball so cap good, asked me man. if I was selling Mario. I think that may be a narcotic. Yeah, um, he's asking me if I've got any Luigi. I don't know what that is. <laughs> is that some sort of? It sounds like the marijuana. Yeah, that sounds like the devil's lettuce to me. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it's green too but anyway uh they uh just stuff like that man just really turned me off with the whole thing and you know like on the flip side man there'd be times that i'd roll up to and i'd know the value of these games you know if somebody had a chrono trigger if for five bucks you know what i mean i'd be like damn that game goes for like a hundred bucks loose you know what i mean but every now and then you'd run across the little sweet old lady that just had some of the most baller ass games in a box and she wanted like a quarter a piece for him and, just uh, and you'd rob that little old lady right now. wilson's like quarters too much i'm taking your box of shit i'm kicking you and i'm out <laughs> i'd talk her down i'd be like would you take a dime a piece yeah, i mean if on. i buy quarters, all of them quarters, <laughs> that's more than i tip the pizza guy fuck no no on the real though you know your conscience would kick in and you know there's like i don't know i got a soft spot for old people man they've put their time in i hope I hope someday when I'm old and I fuck up that some some young punk doesn't take advantage of me or whatever. So, you know, you would. You'd get caught in that moral situation, you know, at a flea market. I didn't give a shit. That's your price. You're there selling goods. You put a price on it. That's your asking price. You know what I mean? But every now and then, like I said, you'd run across that little old lady and you just feel bad about it. But Gary, I, you said you kind of understand the whole physical collecting thing. Like uh, Briar Beasley, do you guys have any, any ambitions to – I, I get it. I just resist because let me move my it's fucking teleprompter. You know, I just don't want I don't want my house filled with that shit. I just don't want right. it. I don't I don't want to do it. it. It's it's attractive to me. I think I'm I'm a hoarder by nature. You'd see it when I play games, you know, like Destiny or RPG games. I just save everything. And I think if I were to start down that path, I would end up with a, a house full of arcade machines or NES games or whatever. So I just I try and stay away from it. Yeah, I've been a collector for a number of years. I uh, just did a quick look around. I got 44 consoles in here, um, including my handhelds. And, uh, you know, there was a time when I was foolish and I had fifth generation game consoles and I put them into storage, went through a horrible separation and moved out of state and lost all my stuff. So I had to completely restart again back, I want to say 2011. And uh, up until now, I've amassed a huge collection of retro games, mint condition, box Super Nintendo games, and pretty much everything I've ever wanted. There's a few things that are out there floating around that I feel like will come to me in time. But as it is right now, this entire space is dedicated to my gaming. And when I look around, I'm very, very happy to, to see an environment that reflects my personality and, and 
it makes me feel good as a man to look around and say, God damn, I'm almost 40 years old. I'm a, I'm a bona fide nerd. And I've carved out a niche and a spot in my life for the things that I enjoy. And I'm lucky enough to have people in my, my life and uh, in my home who enjoy them just as much as me. But yeah, this is a, this is a very important part of my life. I love it. I can, I can support and endorse everything that you have said and have with the exception of the poster size picture of yourself that you have up on the wall. Yeah. I noticed that too. Basically. Can we talk a little bit about the, uh, the <laughs> self portrait are you doing, there? Man? You're lost. Does he talk back to you? Also, why is Mario private, looking down at you? Private like conversation. Sort of like up there, looking. At Mario is totally judging you. Uh, yeah. Both he doesn't of them look happy. He's got his hands on his hips. Like what the when fuck? What is that office, North Korean fake Super NES handheld you have bought, Beastly? Look, you see the camera up there next. You see that camera up there on top of that Wonder Woman box? I can't jerk off in here because my wife can watch. Okay. So leave me alone. Like I said, man, is it not off putting that Mario's watching you while you're just mid stroke? I mean, that would that would just kill the mood for me. Even well, further, or is enhance that it. Mario's watching you, watching you jerk yeah. off. Is that? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, they're both watching. Now, it's like Inception. That's too many <laughs> levels. Dude. You're gonna get lost. <laughs> you're gonna... Now, now check it out, Briar. You know that that Mario up there used to be in my bedroom, and he was right in the corner, and he was looking directly at the bed. So he's seen lots of un just. just Things that you can't even describe. So what on, do you on, tell on your kids? Podcast. Mario, Mario saw me and your mom conceiving you. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> did. He, he absolutely did. You I know, the, this new face. one he that, saw. That it Mario's all. got the thousand yard stare in his eyes. Man. He sees <laughs> <that> shit. <laughs> That's one deeply scarred Mario. Yeah, he's seen some angles that fucking Ron Jeremy's not seen. That, that, that and just so Mario you know, Briar and Gary, you see that little thing hanging up next to my window, the little bag with the red thing in it. That's another fucking poster. Yeah, so I got a backup plan, okay? You got two posters of yourself in your yeah. office? <laughs> yeah. Like mirrors above Listen, man, right? let me tell you this. In order to find someone in your life who loves you, you got to love yourself first. <laughs> so fuck off. Chat, is there anyone here who has not one but two posters, one being in reserve in case the first poster of themselves yeah. gets damaged somehow? That's exactly why. No. I'm very proud of that poster. Jeez, man. Jeez. Uh, what's next? What else we got for topics? The last topic of the show is a topic by the good Briar Rabbit. He has a, a pretty in, just interesting topic, and he wanted to delve deep into the psyche of the co-host. The question is, are you a leader or a follower? You guys comment below. Let us know what you are, and uh, we'll go around the round table, and we'll start off with Gary. Hold on, I was, I was, I wanted to introduce this a little bit because I was thinking about okay. this today. I was in a situation. Uh, I, everybody knows I do photography, right? Uh, on the weekends, I do sports photography. Basically, we take, uh, you know, teams of kids, like sports teams, and we do, you know, we shoot the shoot the teams, and we we do individual shots, we do team shots, and a lot of days, you know, we'll have six photographers there. We'll have it all lined up, and I tend to approach that job like water. Right is whatever happens. I just kind of flow through it. I get through the day. I try and enjoy myself, being outside, being outdoors, enjoying, you know, having fun with the kids, laughing and giggling. You know, I find that's the best way to approach the whole day. Other people, they they need to very much be in control. They need to be in control of everything that's going on. I, I just don't feel like that. I've I've been in management positions in you know in in days past, and I just don't I don't enjoy that at all. When I run raids, I don't like to be the raid leader. I don't like to be that guy. Uh, I like to be the guy who, you now sure I know what to do, but I'm not out there bossing everybody around. Not that not that the raid leader is bossy, um, mm -hmm. but it's just not the role I like to play. I don't like to be that guy. Uh, I'm ha I'm happy in my life, not leading people, <laughs> not being mm -hmm. management. Uh, in fact, I find that I'm happiest not even being the follower, but kind of being that lone wolf. I don't work well with other people. Uh, I don't I don't find that. When I have a project to do at work that I excel when I am working with one or two or three other people, I excel when I'm given a project yourself. and I, I get to do it at my own pace and, and from start to completion. As soon as I have to rely on somebody else, uh, I get nervous about it. I find that I can't rely on other people for the most part, and it I don't like it. So I personally am not a born leader. 
I will take up that mantle if I absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. And today was one of those times where shit was just going so sideways. People were just fucking off and parents were getting pissed off. And I could tell that uh, with this job is we'll lose a league. Like a sports league comes and they have an awful experience. They'll just look for another set of photographers to do it. We'll lose that league next year. You have to make these people happy. And I could tell that shit was going wrong. <laughs> so I just, I had to step up and I don't like doing it. All of a sudden I start barking out orders. It starts start to sound more like a military program than a, than a photo shoot for kids. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll do it if I absolutely have to, if there's no choice, but I can't stand it. I don't like it. What do you, what do you guys, how do you, how do you guys fall into these kind of. Well, I, I like to think of myself as uh, the term power bottom. So for me, <laughs> It's um, the fuck. Say it again. Say it again. One more time. Power bottom. <laughs> so <laughs> I like to think dude. of myself as not leading the way, but firmly following up the rear. Um, <laughs> this is see, crazy, bro. The, ultimately, if your head's not above the parapet, then you're not taking the flak for anything that does go wrong. <laughs> but if you're nice and close to the person that is leading the way then you're close enough that you get accolades when things do go right. So you're kind of in the, in the two Sweet ways, spot. you know, like I said, it, it's better to be, you know, just that one level down the right hand man, the power bottom of the relationship, the, the man though. behind the man, the man <laughs> underneath the man. Shit. Exactly. <laughs> well, for me, it, it's changed over the years. I grew up, I was the second oldest kid and I was always, you know, chasing my brother's shadow, um, and and following my dad's every order and trying to you know appease people and make people proud of me. And there comes a period in your life where you realize that you have to assume that mantle, uh, that you have to be that one that's being followed. And it's it's intimidating for for the young people. It's very intimidating at first, but like anything else, it becomes who you are. So now. I'm the dad. It's so funny, you know, to hear all my kids call me that. And I think about, you know, to me, just like yesterday, I was growing up as a kid and I, I'm setting the agenda. I'm making the rules. Uh, I'm leading a household. And one that I think I'm doing successful, you know, I'm successfully leading my family. Uh, Interesting I, love these... I didn't even consider when I was putting this question forth, I didn't even consider the family life. But it's almost like two different roles because my work life and my family life are two different things where I very much need to assume a leadership position for the kids. Mm -hmm. But at work, I avoid it at all costs. Let, let me elaborate on that, too. Uh, at work, I'm a lone wolf. Uh, I'm a manager. I run a, I'm a laboratory manager in metallurgy. Uh, I have my own workspace, and it's not to be invaded by anyone. Unless people come in, they need certifications and stuff. And if I'm out of my office, if I'm sick, or if I'm taking a, a vacation time and I come back, all hell's broken loose. So I can't depend on the people I work with either. And the only reason that I, I am uh, rising through the ranks of my employment is because I've set my own agenda. I know exactly what needs to be done. I've been doing it now for a number of years and I'm, I'm good at it, but I don't work. I don't want people in my space. I don't want people getting me sidetracked and I don't want to depend on anyone else because I am the lone guy. So I think I lead, but I lead when I'm not, I, when I'm by myself. So you really can't see it. You know, if I'm in my office alone, I set my own agenda, I set my own schedule, and I, I execute. I get it done. But there's a lot of people around me. Things can go sideways so quick. I just prefer to be by myself. So I'm just like you in the workplace. Family life's different. You got to pull out the strap and bust a few heads. Uh, but it's all for the good. You know, this is the thing for people who have children. Gary, you have children. Briar, you have children. Uh, as a parent, you want to create functioning moral morally competent people who are the evolution of what you are the better version of what you are and in order to do that you have to assume a leadership role recognize your faults and try to divert your children from them the hardest and so, thing bc for me to learn was that sometimes the way to make my kid happy long term happy short or unhappy short -term, right it's absolutely like, if i want to build a functioning adult and that's my goal as a parent right that means that child has to suffer in the short term. Yeah. Sometimes. Not all perfect, the time. Perfect mm -hmm. example. Okay. My boys are out cutting the grass today. And uh, my neighbor, he came over and talked to Brandon, who's 15. He said, hey, man, uh, do you guys want to uh, 
cut my grass, I'll pay you guys a couple bucks. And my, my son was like, um, I don't know, I, I guess. And he said, let me go ask my dad. And so he came in the studio and said, Dad, wants to know if we'll cut his grass. He said, he'd pay us some money. I said, well, you go and work out your deal and see what he's going to do. And so both of my sons went over and talked to the guy. And they came back and they said, well, he's going to pay us $25 cut his front yard. I was like, all right, cool. As soon as they left my office, I said, they're giving me $5. And she was like, why? And I explained to her, when they came back, they didn't understand until I, I, I had to explain to them how business works. They came back in here. Of course, I don't need my kids' money, but you have to learn. I'm not going to give you any kind of cushion that the world is not going to give you. They came back in the studio and I said, five bucks, sit it down. They're like, why? I said, because you're using my equipment and you're using my gas. So you've just extorted your kids like a fucking mafia boss. Hey, man, I think they're getting the money still over here on the floor. But... <laughs> I, I, look, I explained to them. See, my boys are. When they came boy, in, I didn't want their money. It was a token of respect. <laughs> no, it's, it's, like, it's yeah. not respect. It's it's I could the real you world. Being in there smoking it's like you the come here today world, on the, Gary, the day of my look, daughter's birth. This this is the thing that a lot of parents do. Love they try it. to be friends instead of parents. And if you if you're the kind of parent that you know just sugarcoats life for your kids and they can say and do what they want, then that'll be the child that's the, the statistic on TV because they're used to their parents allowing them to do what they do whatever they want. Then they go out to the world. Judges don't abide by those rules. Police officers don't abide by those rules. You have to teach children according to the world that you live in. I don't want their money. Actually, when I take them fishing Sunday, that's going to be their money to fish. I kind of, so, I kind of agree with you on this one because, like, in a sense, like they are going to get older and they're going to make money, and everybody's going to have their fucking hand out. And it's not just friends and family; it's people that you actually have to pay. Yeah. You know, there's always a fee. There's always fucking there's every fucking week I turn around. You know, there's a new bill to pay. There's, you know, someone with their hand out, you know, and I kind of feel you, man. Get them get them used to that at an early yeah, age. My boys, one's a, a, my, a my mom senior. sugarcoated it, man. It was a culture shock for me. <laughs> my, boys are, my boys are <laughs> sophomore and junior in high school. And it, just a blink of an eye, they're going to be free to fly from the nest and go out into the real world and they need to understand that business exists and, and you're, there's going to be consequences for every decision you make. Sometimes you're going to make good deals. Sometimes deals don't look quite as good. Run but, boys, run for the mountains. We well, can live up there free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Learn how to fish. Those are called, those are called hippie communes. See, earlier on <laughs> so, you said so. that as a parent, your job is to try to make your kid kind of uh, a better version of you or like, you know, kind of like your, your best qualities. And, Lord knows I've tried, but it, it's difficult to make someone as good as myself. It's, you know, I've tried. The kid's a slow learner. Like, I, I keep, <laughs> I'm, I'm banging it into him, but he keeps disappointing, you know. It's, it's, I've set the standard too high. I think that's the problem. Um, I don't know. Have maybe you, you guys have, just got low, yeah, low yeah, hurdles have, to reach. Have you bought him a VTech ch child's computer yet? You need to do that. It looks like a PC for kids. Let Man. him check the frame rate on it. Let That's him a primitive his... creature. He plays on my 4K sort of 1080 Ti setup. Well, it looks like you got him going in the right direction. I have. He, he can't hit the elite... buttons. I mean, the kid's three. I was expecting something a bit more competent. He didn't. He didn't get one kill in the game that I put him on. I put him on a match. <laughs> Destiny went negative. I was disappointed. I'm gonna be you honest. Were you grounded him because he fucked your KD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, my Elo. Elo. Think about my Elo. <laughs> We gotta get you to your own takes... account. This is ridiculous. Oh man! Yeah. I turned around to him. I told him he takes <laughs> after his mother. That was fucking ridiculous. <laughs> well, for for me, like uh, you know, back to the whole like uh, leader follow thing. There's a lot of people in chat who know me pretty well, and you guys know me pretty well. Um, I've always said it. Like and some of the people may call bullshit on this. We'll have to pay attention. Um, <laughs> they, uh, I'm more of a right hand man, a lieutenant. I like to be a lieutenant. I'm a dependable person. If the leader needs something done, I'll make sure everyone does it. You know, I'll motive, I'll motivate them as best I can, whether it's positively or negatively. You know what I mean? Like, if let you know why you fucked up and why, and this is what we got to do. You know, we don't got all night. We need to get this raid done. There are times I've had to step up to the mantle and be a leader. I'm not a fan of it because it's a lot of pressure that, you know, if your idea doesn't work, then, you know, you look like a fucking Fame. asshole. But, yeah, totally. So, listen, you <laughs> are a born leader. <clears throat> I you, don't know. You step into that role so naturally and without – and when I'm with you, when I'm playing, like, trials with 
it never is like, oh, Wilson's running the show. It's just like, I'm just listening to Wilson do, and it's just a natural it's, part of the conversation. Yeah. Well, here's here's the thing. Sometimes you got to know when there's too many chiefs and not enough Indians. And I have mm-hmm. no problem being like, I will be an Indian for this. I'm definitely open to suggestions. There's times that we're playing trials and I say, let's go this way. And someone will remind me, dude, you know, they've been waiting for us there the past two rounds. I'm like, absolutely. You're right. We should commit to the other side. Knowing when to lead. You also have to follow and you have to know when to follow. You're not always going to be a leader in every situation. There is this hierarchy, no matter where you go in the world, whether it's in the video game world, whether it's your workplace whether it's fucking driving down the highway and you get pulled over by the police officer. You know, there's always a fucking hierarchy. There's always, you got to know when to follow. That's what I'm saying. You can't lead unless you followed before. And sometimes you just have to realize, like, for instance, for the raid, you know, uh, made it to the very end on the first day, blind. Next day, went into a group of people that had a completely different method than what we were doing. It was similar, but there were some differences. And... At that point, I was like, look, I'm the new guy coming into this raid. I need to learn to do it the way they're doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to come in and be like, we need to do it this way because it's more efficient. Like sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's just easier to fucking go with the flow sometimes. You know what I mean? And I think you touched on that, Briar, where you said like your job. Some days it's like water. You just go with the flow. And some days you got to fucking lasso everyone in. Yeah, Yeah, you got to crack a whip, lasso everyone in. You got to do what you got to do. But um, f- for me, like, I, I like the lieutenant position. I like the right hand man of like, this is what we need to do. Control your side, you know, maybe be the leader of one side of the raid, you know, uh, you know, guys are going into the purple room and we're staying in the throne room. Yeah, maybe. But I've always felt like it's not quite a leadership role. It's more of a lieutenant. I'm always open to suggestions, other ideas. There's been many times that I thought I had the best strategy for a certain approach to something and never been happier to be proven wrong when it works, you know, like some humble. Yeah. Yeah. Humble. Exactly. Like, you know, like the four of us, if the four of us went into a match or whatever, like the four of us are each going to have a different perspective on what's going on and what a potential solution may be. And not everyone's going to have the solution 100% of the time. You know, mm-hmm. it's always you're bouncing ideas and sometimes that's new ideas a, come. That's part of good leadership, too, <laughs> uh, is recognizing the good idea, implementing that. Yeah, and, like, sometimes ideas don't even come about if you guys weren't bouncing them off each other to begin with. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess if I apply it into my, my job, uh, my role, I like to kind of think of myself as the little finger of financial services. Um, kind of like... Trying to control as much as possible, <laughs> but from the back lines, you know what I mean? Like for yeah. me, I think good leadership and good diplomacy is never knowing people, not knowing that you're ever influencing them and not knowing how much, you know, and never showing your hand. You're a scary as I said, fucking guy, Gary. Damn, man. Gary's been playing us the whole time. That shit. shit. Oh, <laughs> Game of Thrones, epic mind blown. <laughs> Gary just... is little finger and been pulling the strings the whole time. I know, man. Chaos is a fucking I was fucking wondering ladder. where I get all these fucking Vitas from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just bought a brand new computer and everything. What the hell? <laughs> That's just how I've approached my life, man. I just, I try to, again, influencing people is the best thing, you know, that you can possibly do. Uh, if you try to lead people, then you're always, as I said, in the forefront, being visible, being seen, influencing people on their hands far, far safer and easier to do. They don't even know you're leading them. It's uh, Damn, generally bro, a stronger he just position. Owned you, bro. How much shit have you bought? And just think of the way that he introduced it to you. That oh, my God. He's that is our, that. That's how we met. He was telling me about Brian Oculus told me. Rift. He said, yeah, I've, been, I've been hanging out with Gary. I'm getting ready to spend $20,000 on this. Uh... <laughs> like, Who the fuck man. is Gary? Who the Wise fuck is that guy? Wise <laughs> man, bad movie. Right? Wise man once said in a bad movie, the smartest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing us he's not real. Yeah. And that's true, man. How yeah. dare you, Gary? That movie is awesome. The devil's advocate. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> bad <laughs> movie. Keanu Reeves. Fucking Come Al Pacino, on, man. man. He was, he was not <laughs> a good show. I couldn't enjoy it, dude. I went and saw that movie with my parents in the movie theater back in the day, and I'm pretty sure there was there wasn't there like was nice sex wasn't there a sex scene in that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was 
I was like, what the fuck? I'm like at the I'm at the mo- pa- movies with my parents, and there's a sex scene. And this is weird. Turn your head, Ryan. Man, no, what a f- funny, funny film <laughs> sex story. First date. Have you ever seen um, uh, what's it called? History of Violence with Vigo Mortism, yeah, where he yeah, is yeah, a, yeah. That was the best sex scene of all time. Aggressive eating out going on, right? And I went on a first date to see that movie. <laughs> He was he down on that bitch frontal, on the man. stairs it pretty, was pretty fucking too. aggressively. And I was just <laughs> like... the hell out of it. <laughs> I, was like, this, I like this guy. Man. I was like, she, she is she going to expect that from me now? My <laughs> right. Was, right. He's so tossing Gary's some salad. That was like some, some fucking romaine lettuce getting tossed yeah. in that episode. Gary's in a it position. Is, do I... Do, yeah, is she, is, is she expecting this? Do I go for it? Do I take the aggressive like, approach? Or, sometimes I'm going to watch, watch this girl I mean, make a Gary's decision like, on her based on her reaction. She's going to be sorely disappointed if she is. Yeah, <laughs> Literally, <laughs> sorely disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and sorely Vigo, Vigo, Mort- Vigo Mortensen's a freak. I was like, Aragorn, man, you got fucking... <laughs> Hey, Gary. Zero to a hundred real Gary, quick. He's not fucking he, with hobbits no he really, more. Like. He really did that, Gary. There's no way that that, that wasn't really done. Oh, he was I mean, he was he was in there. Yeah. yeah. So that if you guys haven't seen the history of violence, an incredible film, please, please check it out. I would like to say this uh before. I wonder why my wife kept recommending that movie. Now I, know. <laughs> now I get it. <laughs> tell you, son. It was so freaky ass shit, man. It was like, like yeah, check out History Paris. of Violence. It's Levels. fucking phenomenal. It's my favorite movie of all time. You gotta watch it. Yeah, you can't watch it. It was, it was out of character. I've seen a couple of movies like that. There was one of them that I saw where the girl just went fucking gave him like a full on blowjob in a park. Uh, there's some weird shit that I've seen. But you got to admit though, Gary, that movie, the, the the twist of that film was incredible. Right? I, I don't know. It went a bit John Wick towards the end. It was just the first ten minutes of the film. It's just the like first ten minutes was fucking it. crazy. The first ten minutes, I was like, this is Aragorn of fucking Gondor eating a bitch out in the cinema, like. And she was fine as hell. I, I was, I was. Tastes shocked. like baby powder, Gary. Tastes like Again. baby powder. Let me just say this before we uh, close the show today. In this baby been, powder, man. Is, <laughs> this episode. This episode has been the favorite episode I've ever done in my entire life. I've had so much fun talking to you guys, uh, looking at the comments, and and being in this group and sharing all these thoughts. Uh, I love the questions this week. You guys hit it out of the park. This has just been the cap of my week and uh, i thank you guys for being here and being a part of it this was awesome this is my favorite podcast i've ever done in my entire life today this episode Watch it was love, awesome man. it was a good time i've been laughing my ass i'm still laughing my ass i'm off. gonna be honest yeah. i was just killing time until i went to bed I've... i'm just here <laughs> i was watching you drink that monster drink. you'd be up till 4 a.m i've still got more to go man i'm yeah. just gonna <laughs> I'm going to go watch History of Violence after this if I'm going right. to <laughs> Pick up some tips from Vigo. <laughs> yeah. Watch that movie if you want to learn. If you're going on a first date, watch might that. might want to let the monster gone. energy wear off before you attempt to <laughs> yeah. recreate that yeah, movie. Yeah. You might go yeah. a little too hard. Side note. It's fine, man. Film. I'm just going to I'm gonna get my stride on you. Know, there's a day when the strength of man may fail, but it's not this day. That's what I'm going to That's going to be my chant before I go down. <laughs> Check it out, guys. The very first movie that Kate and I ever went to see was called Obsessed with Idris Elba and Beyonce. I can't remember the the other actresses in the film, but it was about this professional, well-to-do black couple, Idris Elba and Beyonce, uh, who work in a very prestigious part of town. And this new girl, I forget her name, but her mouth is always open. She was Claire Redfield in the Resident Evil films. Blonde chick, can't close her mouth. Anyway, she went to work there, and she came on hard to Idris Elba. And basically, it was... Some real fucked up shit she was doing trying to get this guy to get into her pants. And and there's, that was the first date that I went on with my wife. And I told her that that's exactly what was going to happen to her. And it was true. And she's watching right now. I was right, wasn't I? You know what? As we're ending the show, and I think we should keep it on the topic of schlongs because that's been what we've done. Little uh, project for you. Homework for all of our viewers here. Big related homework. I like it. It is. <laughs> If you've got time um, and you've got private searching up, uh, I'd recommend Incognito for this search here. Idris Elba, Big Dick, right? Oh Please God. search it. Google Images. I did not think it was all going you need there. to know. Holy shit. All you need I've to know. I've never watched Luther again the same way. I just, I just want to point good out. I just want to point out that when Gary says, I want to keep it on the topic of dicks, me, Beastly, and Briar all very seriously were like, Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not in our heads. <laughs> More dicks. Yes. We all are in agreement. 
<laughs> check it out. You won't be disappointed. Google Images, man. What I'm going to say is I looked at that and then it made me feel bad about myself for the rest of the day. So I think Kate's looking at it right now. That's her favorite actor. <laughs> Oh, man. All right, let's wrap this one up, guys. Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate it. I, a little, little extra little extra revolver this week. Ooh, we got a, yeah. A little bit of a long episode, but I I think it was a good one. I, I really had a good time, too, Beastly. Yeah, it was man. a beautiful day. It was great. It's beautiful. Morning. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next week. Episode 11. Time to go to heaven. <laughs>